I will call this meeting to order in accordance with the open meeting law of the Lake of Pacon Commission as close notice of this meeting will be accomplished by having the date, time, and place thereof delivered or mailed or electronically mailed to the following. The daily record posted on the Lake of Pacon Commission website. Stand in front of me and salute to the plate. Flag behind you. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get started, Okay. So we're all here and, and I, I want to move this meeting along because I'm I'm sure that the public portion of this meeting is, is going to be lengthy. So we're gonna do a few items of business which is necessary for us for the month. And, and then we'll, we'll have some presentations, one by um, Commissioner Catherine McKay, for, uh, who is the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. And we also have Olivia Glenn with us, who is the Director of Parks and Forestry. We have two state senators, Senator Panaccio, Senator Orojo, and the <coughs> Senator Cooper. So I'm going to let him, um, we acknowledge, I, I believe, some yes. Something worth. worth is also good. Okay, so we're going to limit the, the public speaking tonight to two minutes. The Fred's going to be the timekeeper down there. We're all we're all in this together, so let's just get through it. And make your statement. Try not to repeat what somebody else said or say what you said previously, so we can stick to the time now. Okay, would you call a roll, please? Fisher Crowley? Here. Fish? Here. Jarvis? McCarthy? Here. Wazowski? Here. Cross? Servas? Steindow? Here. Stevens? Here. Tessier? Here. Dave Smith? Miracle Susan? Miracle Susan here? He was in the other one. Zocek? Senator? Here. Ustalaza? Solaro? Here. Smith? Here. Okay, we have a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Any comments or questions on the minutes? So we're all please. Crowley? Yes. Fish? Steve. McCarthy? Yes. Wazowski? Yes. Steinbaum? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Uh, Senator? Yes. Solaro? Yes. Smith. Yes. We have the treasurer's report and the list of bills. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Any comments or questions? Go to roll, please. Crowley. Yes. Fish? Yes. McCarthy? Yes. Wazowski? Yes. Steinbaum? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Uh, Senator? Yes. Solaro? Yes. Smith. Yes. Um, no, I mean, it's all, it's all there. Okay. All right, so uh, so let's get right in, into the program. The Lake Packard Foundation, you want to give us an update quick? Uh, okay. 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 Hi. Okay. I did write a report, but written remarks this time because it's a little bit more of a stressful situation for me. All right. Um, we at the Lake Impact on Foundation share everyone's frustration with the advisory against swimming and other activities on the lake and are heartbroken about the way the news of it has affected the community, including what it has done to limit business and recreation on and around the lake. It has been a trying couple of weeks, personally and professionally, to say the least. So often when we talk about the lake environment, our minds zero in on the flora, fauna, and water itself, all of which are essential to a healthy ecosystem. 
that the ability of residents and visitors to use the lake for recreation is also a key reason why we need to be vigilant in protecting the lake from runoff, reduce nutrient levels wherever, poss wherever possible, and carefully monitor water quality trends in the lake. Nearly a year ago, during the summer of 2018, the Lake Opakon Foundation board and staff undertook a major strategic planning effort. Of the 12 overarching goals we established as a group, three of them come to mind as we face this situation. One is thinking big and innovative with water quality solutions for Lake Opakon. Two is increasing advocacy for the lake. And three is bringing together town leadership for the benefit of the lake. Within those goals, we established objectives that included re-engaging in the issue of switching parts of the lake from septic to sewer, spearheading a municipal review of stormwater ordinances, and more frequently connecting state, regional, and local officials on lake issues. We also had, we also had several goals related to our education program, which we've been hitting this spring as we welcome 1,200 students to Hopakong State Park and the floating classroom. We take that opportunity to talk to kids about ways to prevent nutrient runoff and protect the lake. For the wider community, we're developing a lake-friendly homeowner guide for those on the lake and in the watershed. And if there's enough interest, we will initiate a lake-friendly certification program next year. In the days, weeks, and months ahead, we are optimistic that we can make progress on all of these goals we have set for ourselves, and we hope to channel some of this energy and urgency we are all feeling to encourage positive changes for the lake, to help reduce the chance of facing an algal bloom or similar crisis situation again. We know our mayors, town councils, legislators, and the Lake Pakong Commission all value the Lake Pakong environment and experience as we do. And we are confident that the more we can do to bring people together to talk about big picture solutions, the more widespread and lasting any changes can be. Now, on to other updates. Uh, I'd like to also remind you about the Smithsonian Waterways exhibit, which is at our building at 125 Landing Road in Landing. Uh, where the importance of clean water is further explored, uh, which is a more fitting exhibit at this time than we ever could have realized when we applied for it in 2016. In conjunction with that, we also have a wild and scenic film festival with 11 short films playing this Saturday at 7 p.m. at the Palace Theater in Nekong. You can learn more about the hours of the exhibit and register for the film festival on our website, uh, www.lakeofhackonfoundation.org. Um, also, the Mount Arlington and um, Roxbury Public Libraries are holding what, what is your water story? A community conversation events on July 25th at 6.30 p.m. in um, Mount Arlington and July 30th at 6.30 p.m. in Roxbury. All of these events are sponsored by the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Um, we're also happy to report that the Water Scouts have been responsive with checking their assigned areas, though we are advising them to be careful if they go paddling before the advisory is lifted. Uh, this season so far, 40 water chestnut plants have been removed from near Liffey Island. Um, and the lake stewards will begin their shifts this Thursday at Lee's County Park, educating watching boaters about how to prevent the spread of invasive species. Um, and finally, those who order dock numbers this spring, will, you should be receiving them within the next couple of weeks. So those are my updates. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay, thank you. Commissioner right. McCain, you want to give us an update from the evening? Good evening, everyone. Uh, wow, what a turnout. Uh, I am not the least bit surprised because you have a gorgeous, gorgeous lake here. And I understand fully, as a lake girl myself, I grew up in Lake Country in upstate New York, how upsetting it is to have this harmful algae bloom um, erupt, especially in the We're time. Not, no, 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 no. Closer. Yeah. All right, kiss the mic, I get it. Uh, at any rate, I'm, I'm up here because uh, I thought it really important to see what is happening myself. Um, I was out on a boat with other folks from DEP uh, just this afternoon, and you do have a very, very beautiful lake here. And I know how upsetting it is to have this harmful algal bloom develop, especially right in the beginning of the summer and right at the uh, 4th of July uh, celebration that we all treasure so much. Um, so, uh, really, our hearts go out to the uh, Lake community here, to all of you, um, for having to uh, deal with this. We understand what a big problem it is. I can personally tell you that the men and women of DEP, uh, some of whom are here tonight and are going to be making a presentation to you, have been working really, really hard um, since this algal bloom first developed to get out there and monitor it with aerial flights um, as well as uh, in the water sampling. Uh, we will be stepping up those efforts, adding uh, to those two things, aerial flights, aerial flights, aerial flights, 
Can you hear me? No. 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 Something happened. Try again. No. Does this work? Does this work? It's the speaker All right, well this is going to be a real challenge. Can you hear me if yeah. I talk really loudly? Talk louder. All right, is, is the mic picking that up? Ah, all right. That's on now. Okay, this one's working now. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Here's what you need to know, here's what you want to know. We will be out there doing aerial flights still once a week. Uh, we will be doing water testing on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which means that you'll be able to see the results on Wednesdays and Fridays. The people of the DEP have been working really, really hard. They tried so hard last week to get out there and monitor, hoping that we would have better news and be able to lift the uh, swimming advisory before the weekend. But we have not seen from the testing that was done through last Friday uh, much change yet at this point. More rains, as you know, came over the weekend. Um, that could go either way in terms of what effect that has on the lake. Um, it could either help by washing things out and helping the algae clean up, or it could, um, not algae, they're actually bacteria, um, or it could go the other way um, and make it worse. Somebody found the plug. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> uh, so we will share with you um, all of this information. Today we got our website up, so you'll be able to go to the DEP website. People worked overtime really hard to get all the data they've been collecting put together and up on that website so that it's available to all of you. And we'll keep posting it there so you, you'll be able to see as, as quickly as we can get it to you, the information about what's happening in the lake. So unfortunately still, um, we must continue our swimming advisory. We are advising no personal contact with the water because it may cause rashes, gastroenteritis, or um, irritation to the respiratory tract if you're um, heavily exposed to it. Um, but you can get out there and boat. I was out there this afternoon with a number of other people and the, the boating is just fine. So um, get out and enjoy the water in the, in the way that you usually do on boating. Um, and we will uh, keep monitoring to let you know um, what we're seeing and let you know as soon as we can lift any part of that swimming advisory. Um, be particularly careful to keep your pets away from the water because the little and your little children, what, um, vulnerable small bodies are more vulnerable uh, to the effects uh, than others. Now, you may yourself have been in the water and found that you didn't get a rash, um, uh, or you may have gone in the water and gotten a rash, which is the most likely result that you're going to see um, in, in immediate terms. But it really varies with people. So some people may have that reaction and some people may not, or they may have it only at higher levels. Um, so we are really going to be working hard to uh, keep monitoring that lake and figure out what's going on with it. Um, I would like to present to you for the presentation one of our best scientists, um, Leslie McGeorge, who is the administrator of our Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring. Um, I, I am not going to give the presentation because I am not the scientist. We're watching the scientists. So Leslie, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Can you, can you hear? Is this one working? Yes. Okay, thank you. I want to begin by thanking many of you in this audience uh, for your diligence in reporting suspected harmful algal blooms to the department, for working with us in partnership. Many of the local health departments have been coordinating with us, and the, the Lake of Pacon Commission getting the word of the advisories out. I want to thank you for helping us work through this harmful algal bloom. I also want to uh, mention uh, three people that are with us today that have been working on this harmful algal bloom for DEP. Bruce Friedman, who is the director of the Division of Water Monitoring and Standards. Johannes Franken, who is our Lakes Monitoring Manager, manager in DEP. And 
Rob Newby, who is with the Division of uh, Science and Research, our microbiologist. With that, I'll uh, begin with the presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk to you briefly about what our cyana have, uh, how they occur, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. If I revert to the term have, I'm sorry, it's an acronym for harmful algal blooms. Thank you, Sean. Um, if I also, my voice goes too low, let me know again. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to mention also that the state has a harmful algal bloom recreational strategy. And everything we're doing here relates to that strategy that was developed by multiple departments in the state government. We've also been working on and trying to improve, and you can help us with ways to do this better, the outreach about how to protect yourselves from harm harmful algal blooms. And we've had a website with a lot of those outreach materials on it for uh, quite a while. Uh, and that's the website that we're adding the data specifically from this lake to um, that we have added that for your use and understanding. We're going to cover the half, the harmful algal bloom that has occurred in this lake over the last couple weeks, and the reports, the field monitoring that the commissioner mentioned, and the aerial overflakes that are being applied for one of the first times ever in a lake in New Jersey. Um, also, the advisories that have been put in place for the open waters um, that, again, the Commissioner mentioned, boating is allowed but not contact is recommended, and beach closures, and then the current status. What, what do we know right now? What are cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms? As the Commissioner mentioned, these are bacteria. Uh, they are naturally occurring in a lake, in fresh waters. What is not natural is for them to increase in their density and become visual, visual and be blooms. So that is an indication of something out of balance in the lake. So when a bloom occurs, uh, they can uh, produce cyanotoxins or toxin materials that can be particularly toxic. Uh, blooms can produce toxins and have adverse effects but even blooms that do, do not produce the toxins at levels above safe levels can have the types of effects the commissioner mentioned. Uh, the dermatitis, the gastroenteritis, the irritative effects. So we are concerned about both blooms that are high cell density and those that are producing toxins. And I'll tell you what we're finding so far in this lake in a minute. What are the risks? I mentioned this to some extent already, humans, flu-like symptoms, fever, gastroenteritis, um, rashes. Rash is a very common symptom, and again, as the commissioner said, there are, people have different sensitivities to this. Um, I've heard it equated to poison ivy, where you may have different sensitivities to rashes um, from the cyanobacterial blooms. Um, there are more serious potential effects particularly when the blooms are producing toxins at higher levels. We have not seen that here yet, and I hope and do not expect, but and I'd be absolutely certain that we won't see that here. Uh, those effects would be liver, kidney, or nervous system effects. Animals are also susceptible to the effects of cyanobacterial blooms. Um, wildlife, waterfowl uh, could be susceptible, fish, Pets, particularly dogs, are known to you know, be a concern. So as the commissioner said, that's something that you don't want your pet to go in the water and maybe get this on his fur and then lick it off. That could be a concern. Livestock are also susceptible to cyanobacteria, um, cows, horses. What causes the blooms? Quite frankly, there are many, many complex causes. We do not know one single cause of blooms, but again, it is indicative of an ecosystem out of balance. There's something out of balance in the lake. Um, this slide, if you can see it, and I understand you probably can't in the back, so I'll just tell you that it's talking about a number of nutrient enrichment processes, a lot of stormwater runoff processes, agricultural runoff, variety of urban runoff that can carry nutrients in the water. Blooms are often related to human nutrient enrichment. Not always, but often. Um, and under conditions of high temperature, 
calm water, and high sunlight. Those are the conditions that are ripe to uh, result in the bloom of cyanobacteria. Again, they are naturally occurring, so they are always present at low numbers in the lake. Um, those uh, cyanobacteria then can be transported downstream and affect you know, other water bodies as well. I should say that this slide is um, courtesy of the United States Geological Survey. Next, please. So if, what was the need for the state to develop a response strategy? Um, there is increasing global and national concern about cyanobacteria blooms. Some of this is we are more conscious of it, there is more reporting. There is some evidence that these are actually increasing across the country and globally. The primary concern is recreational exposure and drinking water exposure. Those are the two primary concerns. Um, you may have heard about some very high profile blooms in the United States. Uh, Lake Erie was impacted in 2014. Half a million people um, were without drinking water for a while because there were toxins in their drinking water. Similar economic and ecosystem impacts, uh, recreational impacts um, to the Ohio River and Lake Okeechobee in Florida. These are high profile blooms that you know really resulted in um, the loss of recreational opportunities, drinking water resources, and economic impacts in other parts of the country. So because of all of that, we felt it was really important to have a response strategy in New Jersey and be prepared for perhaps um, potentially of this type of magnitude here and develop the interagency work group to develop the strategy. The interagency work group includes DEP, many programs in DEP. So it's not just the monitoring programs, it's the science program, it's the uh, parks program, uh, fish and wildlife program, the drinking water program, they're all involved, as well as the Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture. So it's an interagency group developed the thresholds that we're using to evaluate the results and the monitoring and we're doing research and we're fo trying to focus a lot on the outreach side of things as well to be as effective as possible with the outreach. So the purpose of that strategy is to, to provide a unified approach you know, across state agencies, across state programs so that we're all working for the common actions in the same way. Um, and that is coordinated by the Bureau of Freshwater Biological Monitoring, which is our program. Have reporting. Many of you have been doing a very good job with this, um, and just why we knew the extent of the extent of the um, the bloom or the suspected blooms around the lake. If you do see something that you believe is a suspected harmful algal bloom, um, we are asking that you call the 1877 Warren DEP. That is a DEP communication center and that will make sure it gets to us. Um, you can also use the uh, Warren NJ DEP mobile app, which is up there. Um, on our website at DEP, we have a button on the home page that'll get you to all those things too. Um, and we also have a harmful algal bloom website. Now, Carrie has um, a copy of postcards that I left on the table out there. And the postcard has the website, because I don't know if you like me, I don't you know, write it all down. So it's right on the, on the website, it's basic information. If you've run out of postcards and you really want one, just let me know, and we'll make sure you get one. Okay, um, there's a report I have button also on our website, so you can report it there. I would ask that if you report it, please report it to the DEP Com Center. Um, we do have also have an online reporting form, but the best way to make sure that it gets to the communication center and we see it right away is through that Warren DEP app or the um, phone call. Next, please. Um, the HAB response, we have tier responses. We are focused very much on trying to reduce from the public health perspective the greatest levels of exposure. Um, so we are really focused on uh, bathing beaches, youth camps, um, if any of that is affected, we are immediately working with the local health departments and the Department of Health at uh, the state level. 
parks, water bodies, we have worked lockstep with parks to train them, to observe, to understand what a HAB looks like, and to respond and, and work with us, and they have done an excellent job with that. Um, or drinking water sources. If it's a water body that serves as a source of drinking water, we are you know, working with our division of water supply on that. Um, other water bodies, we are sampling, we are responding, but the first level is those that we could um, prevent the biggest exposures from occurring by making sure that we stop the recreational bathing if the safety warrants that we do so, or drinking water exposure. Um, how do we monitor? Um, we do it by looking, by field screening, by using um, um, some uh, methods that you're going to hear from in a moment from um, uh, friend Lunau from Princeton Hydro strip tests that are screening tests. Uh, we use meters to test for a pigment that's in this particular type of cyanobacteria. It's called phycocyanin. The good thing about it is it's unique. If we see it, we know we have blue-green algae, or the right term, cyanobacteria. We look in the lab to identify the species and then count the cells. So one of the determinative factors for where it's safe is how many cells we are counting and seeing. And the other is to look at the toxin, if the cyanobacteria are producing toxins, and we measure that with an automated system that measures the toxins. Next, please. What are the thresholds New Jersey uses? This is on our website, it's in our strategy. Um, 20,000 cells per milliliter. Anything over that, we have a particular concern about some of those uh, irritative allergenic effects. And then there are three types of toxins we have advisories for. The most common one, the one you're going to hear about today a little bit more, is called microcystins, and that captures a, a good number of the toxins that are produced by a variety of bacteria. EPA does have some numbers now. They did not when New Jersey developed these advisory guidelines, and their numbers were just released in 2019 and we will be assessing those numbers against the New Jersey numbers shortly. We have two types of advisory signs that we've developed. On the yellow is warning when we suspect a harmful algal bloom, let's say a sensor picks it up or we think it looks like one or someone reports one. Um, and then we also have a danger sign which has been confirmed that it is a harmful algal bloom uh, above the, our thresholds. Our website, again, I'm sorry to those in the back, uh, I just wanted to point out that if you go on the DEP Harmful Algal Bloom website, I circled something at the top. It says have events. So all the known have events, harmful algal bloom events in the state are there. Um, they are, I'm sorry, I should have, I'll rephrase. The reported have events, and whether they are confirmed or not is listed on that, on that site. So Lake Apopkan is listed on that site. So there are a number of other water bodies throughout the state that are experiencing harmful um, algal blooms. That's where you go to get this information. Next, please. Um, the bloom in 2019, this is the first time we've seen something of this aerial extent in this lake. We have seen small harmful algal blooms in isolated coves in other years here but not at this extent. And that's from the aerial overflight. We started seeing these reports. Um, the first ones I saw were Byron Bay, um, and um, that was about June 18th. Additional reports started coming in. The Lake Impact Commission um, wisely put this on their website so people were aware of this, as well as we had posted it on our website. Um, next, please. Um, oh, between June 20th and the 26th, we got more reports. As soon as we got the first report, we sent out samplers to do analysis and to do lab testing. And we were able, unfortunately, to confirm that it was a harmful algal bloom. Uh, we targeted beaches, and some beaches were closed as a result of the testing results. We did the flights that the Commissioner talked about to see the aerial extent to see if it was throughout the lake. And unfortunately, it appeared that it was throughout many areas of the lake. So at that point, um, 
it was necessary to protect public health to advise that all the beaches be closed on the lake due to the aerial extent of the bloom. We, the department produced two press releases with the advisory on June 27th and July 3rd um, with the advisory for the entire lake. And the advisory states to avoid all contact with water from Lake Pacton, Pacton until further notice. People also should not eat fish caught in the lake or allow pets to come in contact with lake water or drink the water. And we continued the aerial surveillance and sampling and analysis. My lab is busy. My field people are busy. And, and they are doing their absolute best to make certain that we need to um, protect public health or we need to protect it. And that when we are able to relieve these advisories that we have the basis for doing so. The reports, actually, Fred, if you could, um, go through that, like, um, just yeah, real quickly. These are the reports between the 17th and the 2nd that we started seeing around the lake. Um, all those green dots, when we get to the end, um, yeah, that was it. So, first, thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it worked that out. Okay, um, uh, first, they were isolated, and then we started seeing all of them. Um, so that's why we started doing more work. Just to let you know, we are applying the most advanced technology we have available to us. Some of this is new to try to evaluate this. Um, meters for that special pigment that's in the bacteria. <coughs> the remote sensing was recently just developed um, to pick up that pigment as well as take the pictures that we're talking about. And we would like to thank um, the folks that are providing two new things to the lake starting tomorrow. Uh, the United States Geologic Survey, as well as DEP, are going to be uh, deploying uh, continuous monitoring buoys that are going to help us understand the condition of the lake, the quality of the lake, and what's going on, and maybe to be able to predict it, predict when it may be going away. Um, these are new, and um, there are water quality effects that help you predict when a have will come about and when a have is happening. I think these, these new technologies will, will help us understand this better. Next. Um, on the website, you will see a map that looks like this. It's going to show you, you know, all the sampling locations, and then the results will be related to the sampling locations. And it's, the results are going to look like this. I know you can't see all of these results, but these are the, we have it divided by two ways, the beaches and then the open water locations that we're doing. Anything in red up there is above our 20,000 cells per milliliter threshold. So, um, no. thank you. <laughs> I never, the colored one is between yellow and red. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Anything in yellow, it's kind of orangey. <laughs> um, anything in yellow indicates levels above the advisory level. Um, so some of these beaches, you'll see one day it's above, one day it's below. We don't have any t clear trends yet. Um, and we have a good number of them that are above. Um, so all of this, the details are on the website if you want to check out any particular area. Sure. You want to go back? No, that's fine. Okay. All right. And then this is the other lake sites that we have done. Um, again, the same thing. We are, you know, sometimes seeing levels go up, sometimes down. It's just bouncing around, which is not unexpected because you have the winds, the currents moving things around. Um, you know, one day uh, you may be sampling at a slightly different time than another. It's not unexpected. But right now we don't have a trend. Um, but we do have enough, unfortunately, results and the results Commissioner mentioned today. That pending line. We have those results, and they just came in at the uh, end of the day today. And unfortunately, we're still seeing some counts that are above the advisory threshold. Not all sites, but a good number. Say that again? Sure, I'm sorry. Today, the sampling that was done on Friday, um, the results uh, came back from the laboratory today. And unfortunately, we are still seeing cell count levels at many sites that are above our advisory level. 
So um, we're not able to um, do anything other than we're currently doing in terms of the advisory in order to protect public health. Next slide. Um, the toxin levels, I just wanted to let you know we are measuring the toxin levels. We are using a laboratory method that Princeton Hydro is using a good screening method for this. And both of us are, are saying that, you know, that toxin levels are not a prim primary concern at this point. We are finding measurable levels, and we found um, levels up to 1.35, and our number is three. So it's below the level. Uh, we do have um, 31 of our 48 samples have measurable levels of toxins, but the levels are very low. Okay. Next slide. Um, what are we doing now? As the commissioner said, continued response and reporting according to the state ab strategy. We are following that standard operating procedure. We're continuing the field monitoring. As she said, we're going to be out uh, twice a week on the on the lake doing the field monitoring. Uh, maybe more frequent when we get to being able to do something with the beaches um, because we need two clean sample results on the beaches in order to open them as per the Department of Health agreement. Um, we're going to continue the flight monitoring of the lake and, as I mentioned, those continuous monitoring buoys to understand what, what might be causing the problem in the lake and, um, you know, to protect blooms. I want to just thank the folks in the Division of Water Monitoring and Standards and Science and Research um, for uh, the tremendous effort that has been made in monitoring um, the, the waters and in doing the laboratory testing and the aerial overflights. And lastly, one more. I, again, back to thanking you, any of you in the audience, um, either you know some of our sister organizations, Parks and Forestry, Fish and Wildlife Department of Health, or the local health departments, um, the Lake Impact Mountain Commission uh, Foundation, Princeton Hydro, who we've been in communication with and appreciate that, and Geological Survey, and those of you that have, uh, you know how much you care for your lake and how much, you know, means to you, and the fact that you uh, care enough to report what you are seeing as a potential concern has really been beneficial to us in understanding this problem. Thank you. My name is Fred Lubno. I'm with Princeton. My name is Fred Lubno. I'm with Princeton Hydro, and um, we're the organization. Um, I've been with the same group of people. We've been monitoring Lake Pakhan uh, since I've been a consultant in the early 90s. But even before then, we've been monitoring in the early 80s. So we have a pretty long data set on Lake Pakhan and its water quality. Um, the presentation I'm going to give is, a, is about 10 minutes long. It's basically taking a half a day course that I developed on cyanotoxins and crammed it into 10 minutes. Plus I added some specific stuff for Lake Apacon, um, specifically for specifically for your lake. All right. Right here? Okay. So, all right. Um, so the objectives of the talk. Uh, number one, you know, what are blue-green algae, also called cyanobacteria? Two, what are cyanotoxins? And three, how are we going to deal with this in terms of long-term management? Um, cyanobacteria, they're, they're bacteria. They're, they're very old organisms. They've been around for a very long time, so they have some pretty unique adaptations. Number one, they can photosynthesize in all kinds of light intensities. So they can photosynthesize down deep or right at the surface. Number two, they have these resting spores called aconites. So they're, like was previously mentioned, they're in every lake. When times get cold, they form these aconites, these resting spores go to the bottom, and then when the lake turns over in the spring, they come back up and hatch. So they are very resistant to a wide variety of environmental conditions. Many of them can fix their own nitrogen, which is really important. What that means is they can take nitrogen from the atmosphere and use it for fuel. But to do that, it takes a lot of energy. 
That means they need a lot of phosphorus. And that's one of the reasons why with freshwater lakes, we really focus on reducing phosphorus concentrations going in. That's what the commission and the foundation have really been pushing for, for years, if not decades. We need, to, we need to starve the algae, essentially. And they love phosphorus. Um, they have enzymes to cleave phosphorus off of particles or off of organic material. So they're very good at, at, at scrounging around for phosphorus. They can regulate their position in the water column. That's why you see those nasty surface scums. If they want all the light, they go right to the surface, they photosynthesize all they want, then they can drop down to deeper waters and fuel up on, on some of the nutrient-rich deeper waters. So they have all kinds of unique adaptations. And then finally, they're not grazed on like other algae. So there are a lot of algae, green algae, diatoms, chrysophytes, they're the good algae. They're the base of the aquatic food web. The blue-greens, they're not, they're not very tasty. Number one, they generate the cyanotoxins, and number two, they make these large colonies, which is what you're seeing. So they have all these unique adaptations. It's very critical that you identify what the algae is, and this was mentioned by DEP. So on, on your left, you see a bloom of a cyanobacteria. On your right, you see a bloom of euglena. And just looking at them with the naked eye, they, they look the same, but it's this one here, this uh, anabina, this blue-green is the one that can generate the cyanotoxins. So you need to do some microbiological investigation and identify what that algae is. A bloom of euglena, which is something you've seen in like high school or college biology, they do not generate cyanotoxins. We did find the two main culprits of the bloom, um, the lictospermum and the other one, uh, Wernicke, um, Oronychia, we found both of those in our samples as well. Those were the ones that DEP identified as being the culprits. Now, there's a lot of dispute about the one over on the right, whether or not it generates cyanotoxins, but the dolictospermum absolutely does. Um, when we did our sampling, so we sampled on the 2nd of July, so as part of our contract with, um, with the Lake Pacom Commission, we do water quality monitoring five times over the course of the growing season from May through September, and then we do two cyanotoxin events where we're going out and we sample at eight <coughs> near beach locations. We were originally going to do it in late July, but obviously with the bloom, the commission asked us to go out early. We went out on the second. So we're actually out on the, the same day. So we did some sampling as well at, at those eight locations. One of them was the Mid Lake. And, and same with DEP, we saw cell counts higher than 20,000 cells per mil, but all, almost all of our others were below the 20,000. So of the eight sampling sites, two had 20,000 cells or greater, the others did not. I can say that with our cyanotoxin testing, all of our results came out negative. Now, we use a field meter. It's very different than DEP taking their samples to the lab and then they actually generated numbers. Our field meters are basically identifying whether the toxins are there or not. And for the two that were identified, the microcystins and the cylindrospermopsum, we were getting negative readings for, at all eight stations. But like I said, two of our eight, we did have elevated concentrations of, of cells. And that's what that advisory is, is related to, is that high cell count is indicative of something that may have some sort of issue related to like a skin rash or, or some other respiratory disease associated with a different cyanotoxin than the ones that are being measured. Uh, I want to emphasize, if you, if you want a bloom, you need three things for the cyanobacteria. You need high water temperatures, you need still water conditions, and you need elevated phosphorus concentrations, typically greater than 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. If you have those conditions, that's usually when you're going to get a bloom. And when we looked at the precipitation data over the course of June, this is showing you how much rain fell over the last month. And I can tell you that we did our water quality <laughs> monitoring on the 14th. So we went out there right after that storm event and we got elevated phosphorus concentrations. So that, what that tells us is these rain events were washing nutrients from the watershed into the lake. And look at how this pattern was set up. 
we were getting these storms. And if you remember, from the week of the 17th on, we would get like 10, 30 minute storm events, and then the temperature would go up to you know, 70 and 80 degrees. Storm event, 70, 80 degrees. On top of that, the following week, we had that mini heat wave. So these conditions really helped to create this situation where the bloom occurred in Lake Papakalan. And that's what generated these blooms. It's the watershed being washed, carrying these nutrients into the warm water, stimulating these blooms. Now I can tell you that you've had these blooms periodically from time to time. We've actually been seeing them late in the fall, but the difference is in the fall there aren't as many people out on the lake or directly recreating, but this is from a bloom. This looks like midsummer, but this was mid-October. And I can tell you that in 2016 and 2017, some of the lakes that we monitor, we had some of these blooms that were persistent well into November. I'm sort of dating myself, but when I started as a consultant in the early 90s, once we hit September, cooler temperatures would, would, would show up and then these blooms would crash. So over the last 10, 20 years, we're seeing more and more of these blooms persist further and further into the, um, uh, into the fall season. And I want to also emphasize, you are not the only lake affected by this weather pattern. We monitor a number of lakes in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, and New York, and this same pattern happened. This is Harvey's Lake in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania which almost never gets cyanotoxin blooms. In the exact same week, Lake Apacon, you had your bloom. Harvey's Lake had the exact same bloom. For the last three and a half weeks, this is all I've been dealing with, which is why my shirt's green. Because this was actually what's really white. But I mean, this is something that has been all over. So there were situations at Lake Mohawk, Spruce Run, Swartzwood. We've been seeing it in Pennsylvania, in the Poconos, Harvey's Lake, um, Waynewood Lake. Um, Octorero Reservoir, we've been seeing it in New York, DeForest Lake had a bloom going on. So this is something that was affecting larger lakes throughout the region. I'm not going to get into climate change, but I can tell you that we're seeing increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide, and this is something that's not just modeled. These are measured concentrations from one of the climate stations in Hawaii where we see CO2 concentrations on the rise, and what we see is the temperature in the mid-Atlantic states, in the northeast region of U.S., has increased. What does that do to Lake Apacon and this region of the United States? Well, the one thing that all these models and all this data is telling us is that we're going to be warmer and wetter as we go further and further into the 21st century. This is just, this is just a fact. This is why when I started as a consultant, again, I sound like an old guy, but when I started as a consultant and we were doing winter sampling, we used to, if we went up to Culver Lake or Swartzwood Lake, we'd have to move the snow, carve through a foot or two of ice, and grab our samples. Now we're lucky if we can even get on the ice. So we're seeing these milder and milder winters. The temperature increased between three and seven degrees Fahrenheit. More importantly, more extreme heat days over the summer season. This means this gives fuel to the fire for the cyanotoxin-producing uh, bacteria. An increase in the frequency of extreme weather events. That means more flooding, more droughts. Um, but probably the most important relative to the cyanotoxins, growing season could increase between 15 and 30 days. And we're already seeing that. The last three years, I've seen the growing season go from toward the end of September to the beginning of November. And then finally, the number of frost days could decrease by 20 to 40 days. So we are seeing how climate change is affecting these organisms. So how can we help to reduce the severity of these blooms going on into the future? Well, one is controlling their, their food, which is the phosphorus. So, you know, um, New Jersey DEP does have a nutrient criteria for total phosphorus for any water body. They want to make sure that the concentration is at or below 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. But they do allow for circumstances, if you feel your water body is sensitive and you need a lower concentration, they will designate that. And that's exactly what we did for Lake Apacon back in 2016. We developed a watershed implementation plan which was based on some modeling that DEP did on the lake and watershed. So we identified that Lake Apacon is sensitive enough 
that we want the phosphorus concentrations in Lake Papacon to be at 0 0.03 milligrams per liter or lower. Um, and we're currently updating this plan. So the plan was completed in 2016. Um, the commission received uh, some funding through the New Jersey Highlands Council to update that plan. This is a really important slide. And the reason why I, I, I did this once everything hit the fan and I wanted to look at the June concentrations of total phosphorus. So this is, and I just happened on my computer, I had the last 17 years of data for Lake Apacon. We have data going into the early 80s, but a lot of that is in boxes. I have, I have some of our interns pulling all that data out. But at least if we look at 17 years of data, and this is the average June concentration, and I can only say June because we're in early July. So, and each data point represents about eight points throughout the lake. What I want to identify is this year was the highest June concentration we've had in the last 17 years. So we want to stay below 0 0.03, but if you look at this past June, we were at the average was 0 0.043 above that criteria. So that, again, warm water conditions, higher phosphorus concentrations, that's what triggered the bloom. And like I said, we went out there the day, you know, the, that last storm on the 14th happened in the morning. We were out there and we measured. And that's the elevated phosphorus concentrations that stimulated this bloom. So I'm not going to get into too much detail since this was already touched upon. What are the cyanotoxins? You know, there are these low molecular weight compounds that can negatively impact people, pets, and livestock. Uh, there are three main types, hepatotoxins, neurotoxins, and then dermal toxins. Um, I want to emphasize something because this is constantly coming up. Cyanotoxins are odorless, tasteless. And, and, and colorless. You can't see them, you can't smell them. This is really important, and this is something that a lot of drinking water companies had to come into the realization. If you're smelling something bad, it's probably a compound such as geosmin or MID, if it smells musty or like rotten fruit, those compounds are different than the cyanotoxins. So just because you're smelling something nasty doesn't necessarily mean you have cyanotoxins. But just because you're not smelling anything doesn't mean that those cyanotoxins are not present. So keep that in mind. You can have water bodies that create these nasty taste and odor compounds and not produce any cyanotoxins. And, or you could have the reverse, where there's no taste and odor problem, but they're generating cyanotoxins. Um, again, I, we touched on this earlier, some of the more common cyanotoxins, the microcystins, Cylindrospermopsum, Anatoxin A, like I said, when we went out the 2nd of July with our field meter, which is different methodology than the lab, we were getting negative results. Um, what triggered all this concern, and it was touched on earlier, was Lake Erie, Toledo, Ohio. And if you look on, the, on, your, um, on your left, you can see that, that the western part of the lake was just inundated with a massive bloom. That's really what triggered this concern over cyanotoxins. It's one of the reasons why we started getting into investing in purchasing these meters and doing this monitoring um, for both drinking water and for recreational water bodies. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail over this, but basically, you know, EPA has, has their specific criteria for the cyanotoxins, but EPA is also considering whether or not to make these compounds regulated compounds. So they're currently under a three-year study to determine if these should be regulated. Um, so for the round of unregulated compounds, there's 30 of them they're considering. Ten of them are cyanotoxins. That study will be completed in 2020. Uh, New Jersey's concern, so it was already mentioned, they do the visual observations. They have concerns over the cell count. You know, if you have greater than 20,000, uh, cells per mil that can trigger an, an advisory or an issue of concern uh, and then also their, this is what their thresholds are relative to EPAs. So New Jersey DEP has thresholds of concern for microcystins, for cylindrospermopsin and for anatoxin A. EPA right now has just for the first two. EPA is currently in, uh, doing a very extensive study and review of the data to determine if there should be one 
uh, for anatoxinate, and if there is, what that level should be. Are we above the EPA threshold? I'm sorry? Are we above the EPA threshold? No, no. The, the, if you look, the EPA thresholds are actually higher than the New Jersey ones. The New Jersey ones are even lower. So let, let me just, let me get through this. I'm, all, I'm, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Um, so the concerns over uh, the cyanotoxins in Lake Apacon. So in response to a bloom back in 2014, actually DEP did some sampling back in 2014. Um, and they did find some elevated cyanotoxins along some shoreline areas that did not have beaches. They did testing at beaches and found it below the beach areas. Because of that, we were working with the commission and with a grant, a 319 grant focusing on stormwater. We had some extra money, so we said, hey, 2015, could we do some cyanotoxin testing? And we did. Back in 2015, negative results. So we had, back then, we were just monitoring for microcystins. Now, um, back in 2017, the commission approached us and said, hey, we're concerned about cyanotoxins. Should we be monitoring for this? So we recommended that we start a long-term cyanotoxin monitoring program. So we're out there twice over the course of the growing season to collect samples at eight beach locations, which is, uh, which is what I've already described. So last year when we did this, we did it twice, once in July, once in August, all negative. There were obviously no issues last year associated with cyanotoxins. Like I said, we were out there Ju uh, July 2nd. Uh, we did not get any hits for the samples that we collect. So what can be done about these cyanotoxins? What can we do to avoid, prevent, or minimize these blooms? Well, there's a three-tier approach. You know, the one I'm not, I'm not going to address are the global issues associated with climate change. I'm not going to focus on that. But what I will focus on is we're currently updating your watershed implementation plan. That watershed implementation plan is a guide, a blueprint, that shows what can be done within the watershed to reduce your phosphorus loads going in. So that the first plan was done in 2016. And when we did that plan, we, we, uh, we uh, the commission, the foundation received a number of grants, and we've implemented a variety of stormwater projects and septic projects and programs, and we've reduced the targeted amount of phosphorus that needs to be reduced in your lake by about a third. So we got about, you know, 33% of it done. We still have uh, anywhere between 65 and 66% to go. So we've been making progress, but there's still more to go to reduce these phosphorus concentrations. So again, that's the long-term goal is for a watershed basis, we want to all pitch together and really focus on stormwater management, septic management, what you can do on your individual lots to minimize your load of phosphorus going into the lake. That is really important. And then the third tier approach is something that actually New York's been doing more and more of, is in some of the larger lakes where you have beaches or bays or coves, if you have a community around a beach, that beach should have its own little restoration plan. Because very frequently these blooms will either start in a, in a beach or a cove area, or they're coming in by the wind, blowing the cells into your, into, along your shoreline or into your bay, concentrating those cells. So what can you do to develop a restoration plan specifically for your bay and cove? And there's, um, this is just showing you the Lake of Pacon watershed, how extensive it is, but in terms of potential restoration measures for your bay, your cove, your beach, there's a number of things you, you may want to consider, but again, you need to do some homework and understand what you know, the average depth of your bay or cove is, understand what some of your, um, how the wind patterns are, and if you're interested in that, please contact the commission because we have a lot of data that we may have for your bay and cove that you can use to develop such a plan. So these plans would consider the possible use of aeration or circulation systems or bubblers to try to avoid the accumulation of cells along your shoreline, the very careful use of algicides. I mean, we don't really like to use copper-based algicides because when you hit the cells with the copper, they lyse and those toxins that are in the cells are more than readily available. But if you're going to use copper, do it in a more proactive than reactive. We've done that where you can focus on knowing when that bloom's gonna come and using less copper, get it under control before it gets completely out of hand. But then there are alternative products like strong oxidizers that can be used as well. They're more expensive, 
but they don't, um, number one, they're not adding copper into the system, and number two, there's some studies to indicate that some of those strong oxidizers may help to break down the cyanotoxins as well. Um, floating wetland islands, ultrasonic devices. The ultrasonic devices, I've seen them work, and I've seen them not work at all. Um, so again, it depends on your site-specific conditions. Um, Possible mechanical or physical removal, and I've only seen that happen one place out in California, which had way too much algae that you, would, you wouldn't even consider recreating in that lake. And then possible nutrient removal through phosphorus stripping in the water column with a nutrient inactivator. So those, those are some of the in-lake measures that you could consider. But again, keep in mind, what's your immediate drainage basin like? You know, do you have an existing septic system? And if so, is it pumped out on a regular basis? And if it's not pumped out and if it's associated with a club, could you possibly get some sort of funding or some sort of alternative source of revenue so you can replace that existing septic system with say, a, like an incinerator toilet or a dry toilet? Something that you certainly wouldn't use in your home but for a club, for a clubhouse, is something that many people will utilize in more of that uh, recreational setting. Um, shoreline stabilization, whenever you have exposed dirt, any dirt that falls into the lake has phosphorus stuck to those soil particles. And that phosphorus goes in and it stimulates that growth, that growth of the algae. So if you can stabilize your shoreline, you know, with vegetation, you know, that goes a long way. And then goose management. Geese, geese are the only, the only, the only bird that generates more phosphorus than a goose is a cormorant. You know how filthy cormorants are. Geese, geese defecate on average 27, 28 times a day. So I would have hate to have been the grad student that figured that one out. But they generate a lot of phosphorus. It's because they're constantly eating vegetation. So they're, they're cows with feathers. They're constantly pooping. So they generate a lot of phosphorus. So some aggressive goose management can go a long way. Source control management. Pick up after your dogs. I have a... On her good days, she's 48 pounds, but on her bad days, she's 50 pounds. My, my English bulldog, Zoe, she generates about two pounds of phosphorus a year. So I know when I walk her, I have to pick up, you know, pick up the poop. Keep in mind that one pound of phosphorus dumped into a lake or pond has the potential to generate up to 1,100 pounds of that green goo you see in a lake. So it doesn't take a lot of reduction of phosphorus to have a measurable uh, response. So remember that one pound can generate up to 1,100 pounds of algae. So minimizing that phosphorus is really key. And then finally, you know, green infrastructure, stormwater BMPs, <coughs> anything we can do to minimize the phosphorus before it goes into the lake will really help to maintain the water quality. Like I said, we started back in 2016. We are moving forward. We're at about a third of the way there in compliance with the overall plan. We're now going to move forward for another um, next, uh, hopefully, two months we'll have the revised plan. And then we're actually going to go to DEP and ask for some potential, you know, with some of their potential sources of grant funding. Maybe we can get some additional projects <coughs> in the ground to do some additional stormwater work. So I know that was a lot of information, and I, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very much, uh, as usual, very informative. Um, are there any pack on commissioners that want to make a statement this time? Or the end of the meeting? GI cells in the winter affect phosphorus? Do they contain phosphorus? Um, most. Uh, the question was is how do de-icers negatively impact phosphorus in the lake? Uh, it just so happens my master's degree was on the effect of road salt on lakes. I, I did that out in California at Lake Tahoe. And um, out there the, the issue wasn't that they contained phosphorus, it's that they were using so much of it around Lake Tahoe for the skiing that it was killing all the vegetation. So Tahoe is a very small watershed and steeply sloped. So what happened was when all this vegetation died, all this dirt was washing into the lake with the phosphorus and that was stimulating a lot of problems. So like anything, I mean, careful use 
of the de-icing can go a long way. I mean, uh, you know, not just willy-nilly putting in as much as you can, but uh, being more proactive, laying it down before the ice. You don't want to hear me go on about the icing stuff. I, I could go on with you. So. <laughs> Uh, Fred, I have a question for you. You didn't mention anything about weed control and its effect on phosphorus. Can you comment on that? Sure. So, um, and you know, there have been there's been a lot of concern. Well, why why does the commission and why does the state focus so much on weed harvesting and why don't we use chemicals? Well, there's two reasons for that. One is the state and federal agencies would prefer not to fund you know, chemical applications. They, they, they will provide funding for mechanical harvesting. And the value to mechanical harvesting is you're actually removing phosphorus. So with mechanical harvesting, you're removing phosphorus that would otherwise fuel algae growth and more plant growth. And as a matter of fact, we know that the existing harvesting program on average removes about 10% of the phosphorus we want to remove through that program. When you apply uh, an aquatic herbicide, depending on the product, when it kills the plant, those the phosphorus associated with that plant then goes down into the sediments and it can stimulate either additional plant growth or weed growth. So um, there is some uh, some applications that are that are done on the lake, which you know that that's fine, but it's one of the reasons why there's not a lake-wide application. There's the concern that you may mobilize a lot more phosphorus and, and, and stimulate a larger bloom. There's, there's just a couple of other things that, that weren't mentioned that I'd like to mention briefly. Uh, one of them is that it's come to the attention of the commission that uh, too many variances seem to be given for lakeside property. There's a tremendous amount of what I consider to be overbuilding close to the lake. Uh, without effective protection for, for the lake itself. And the, the surrounding towns have seemed to be extremely liberal in, in uh, this concern in recent years. Uh, I think that has to be more closely monitored. Another, another thing that wasn't mentioned is the cleanup uh, after the, uh, the town sold the roads. They used to do an extensive spring cleanup with the vacuuming and sweeping of the roads to get up the salt that was still there and the gravel and to keep that from running um, into the lake. And you know, the towns are all hard pressed for funding and I'm not sure that that's being done to the same extent as it once was. Um, uh, and and uh, I think everything else really uh, has been mentioned. One, one other one other small point, um, I'm wondering about the monitoring, you mentioned about human waste, about the monitoring of, of boats on the lake, and, and with what goes on in Byron's Bay with all those people anchored there for the day, I wonder how much contribution there is of human waste, and whether we should be monitoring uh, bathrooms in, in some of these boats more closely. Uh, but these these are all small points. Thank you. Any, any other commissioner wants to make a comment? I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this is something that we've been studying for years. Um, if you walk around your neighborhood, please look down into any catch basins that you see, make note of their condition. They should be empty. They should not be filled up. We have to stop the stormwater loading into the lake. It's my understanding, Fred, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about 40% of the phosphorus loading or the nutrient loading is from. I, I, I can say that the combination of the septic and stormwater combined is 80% uh, of the phosphorus generated that goes into Lake Pack on this one, stormwater and septic. So yeah, it's about 40. Thank you. Can you speak to some of the federal money that has come to Lake and Pack Island? Let's talk about the uh, sediment chamber that is in Crescent Cove at the end and what, how that was designed, what that was intended to do, and what's been going on with that. Sure. So um, once the watershed implementation plan back in 20, uh, oh, yeah, 2006 was developed, um, we then used that document 
to seek funding. So the, um, uh, the, the commission received two 319 grants under EPA's non-point source pollution program. It's EPA money that's given to the state DEPs and New Jersey you know, awarded two of those grants uh, to the commission and we implemented a variety of stormwater retrofits and that's where we get that third of a reduction was all those projects that were implemented. In addition to that, the commission received a targeted watershed grant program through directly through EPA and that, that did some additional stormwater work and then we actually installed an alternative septic system for the daycare at Jefferson. So it's a peat biofilter which was retrofitted onto the existing septic system the peat biofilter really increases the capacity of that system to remove phosphorus. Uh, and then the township of Jefferson received a, a, a DEP grant to develop their, uh, their uh, septic management plan. So they passed the ordinance and we've implemented a variety of uh, educational measures and they do the, uh, the, the, uh, the program monitoring the uh, mandatory pump outs once every three years. So the watershed does get credit for that uh, through the township's efforts. So those those grants, what happened was, is those grants sort of petered out once the recession hit and things got tight. So things sort of cooled down in general. Um, and speaking with DEP, the commission, the foundation, and New Jersey Highlands, everyone thought it was high time to take the existing plan and update it. So that's what we're literally doing right now. I'm hoping that the next meeting we're here, we'll be able to submit the draft watershed implementation plan. We're then going to take that forward and seek additional funding for more of these projects. Thank you. I just want, again, just for the benefit of the people that are first timers to commission meetings, this is something, watershed management, that we take very seriously. We've been studying for years. When this commission got started, it was supposed to be funded back in 2000 with $1.5 million a year. That was supposed to not only take care of weed harvesting, but also some of the stormwater management work. Um, in or about 2001, we had a committee that actually sat down and came up with what it would cost to retrofit or fix a catch basin, right down to a budget. I have copies of the materials from 2001. There's one person in this room who was on that committee. He knows who he is, and, and certainly, um, this material is as timely now as it ever was. We had eight staff in the years where we had adequate funding, and during the off-season, that staff would work with the townships. Two staff members per town, they were matched up with DPW personnel and DPW assets, and they would go around and they would clean out the catch basins. One thing I saw that it disturbed me, I've seen reports in a paper where somebody said, hey, we gotta figure out where these catch basins are and where they go and what they do. I wish I could find the article. I looked for it for an hour earlier today. I couldn't find it, but there was a time in the mid 2000s, it was a New Jersey Herald, Herald article. There was a commission staff member shown with a GPS backpack unit on his back. And he was part of a group that was going around this entire 16,000 acre watershed and mapping each of the catch basins and where they flow into the lake and noting their condition each each catch basin got a a sheet mark noting its location its condition what it needed and where it drained to that data was given to the towns so we need to find that data i know we have old computer systems that we got to go through but we don't need to reinvent the wheel we know where these things start we know where they go and that is 40% of the problem is stormwater management and stopping it. So please, if we have to do something as a community, I'll, I'll suggest tonight an adopt the catch basin movement. Look in those catch basins, ask yourselves, where does that stuff go? So again, thank you for coming tonight. I hope that we have continued high turnout at commission, future commission meetings because it's very important. So thank you. We can get the mic to you later. But we just, so I just wanted to emphasize, you know, the commission does have a land use committee to review all the applications in front of the board of all the towns. We write a, uh, and then a colleague of the commission write a letter to them regarding the recommendations. Since we've been doing that, we still Sorry, thank you. Okay, since since with the land use board's been going to these meetings and reviewing the applications, 
We've seen more than 10 variances from previous coverage increases, intensification of use around the lake, and things that we've been recommending um, that the standards that currently exist in the ordinances should be enforced. And there's a pattern that there's a pattern that they're not, and that this is causing conditions for even increased runoff and nutrients into the lake. And uh, the commission's also talked about looking at all those current zoning protections and seeing whether they, any of those need to be uh, strengthened to try to protect this, because that 40%, 40% from septics, which the whole lake should be sewered, we would deal with that. Uh, real quick, just two things. Uh, Fred brought up some good points as well as uh, Dan about uh, stormwater management. It's just not people who live on the lake. Uh, your 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 uh, stormwater outlets feed into larger systems that could be blocks away from the lake. And I don't think a lot of people realize when they see a, a storm drain where that goes to. So it really behooves everybody um, to be conscious of stormwater management because it's all going into our lake. The second part of it is with, with as far as phosphorus fertilizers. Uh, I'm from Jefferson Township. I serve as the mayor and president of Lake Shawnee Club. Uh, we've done a lot in Jefferson to try to um, control phosphorus in the fertilizers. There's a ban, by ordinance, a ban on fertilizers containing phosphorus. If you're using any type of uh, lawn service, uh, make sure they're not using a phosphorus type of fertilizer as well. Because what you're hearing tonight is that um, you know, this is what's contributing to, to our, the problem we have at hand right now. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to get to the. I know there's a lot of you here. We got a list here. A lot of people want to speak. Take my word for it. You'll you'll get your chance to be heard. We're going to do this in orderly fashion. And there's some officials here that I want to let them go first. Are there? There were two state senators and two assembly persons here. Are they still here? Good. Senator Oral, do you want to? say anything at this point you were responsible one of the people responsible for us getting our funding at some point like the pack on commission got five hundred thousand dollars two years ago we're getting it annually now through the legislation to the whole legislature but they were the main sponsors you want to speak no commissioner thank you very much for this year obviously to learn from what the experts said to hear from all the uh all, all the constituents thank, thank you, you. Okay. Yes, I'm Howard Stevens Center, said we're just here to see what we can do to help out. And I'm happy to thank the commissioner for coming up and we're hoping that maybe some way, some side of sort of pilot program that we can at least try maybe in a concentrated area because just doing what we're doing, quite frankly, isn't acceptable. But thank you and we're just here to listen to you. Anybody, county, county officials here, who were a couple, anybody want to say anything? How about the four mayors? I know we were at our earlier meeting. We already heard from Mayor Will Susan, who wants to speak again. Okay. Mayor Francis, you have anything you want to say? Ed? I want to do Okay. Hello. So we look back to the foundation. Do you have anything you want to add to this morning? Okay. And the Highlands Coalition, are they here? They want to add anything? Julian Summers and Elliot Ruger uh, from the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. We are a coalition of a variety of organizations, more than 100, all of whom care about the Highlands. Today, on their behalf, we're here to support a solution, whatever that may be, to the harmful algal blooms in the lake. 
In case you don't know, recently legislation was signed by the governor that makes possible the creation of local or regional stormwater utilities. It is not the coalition's position at this time that creating a stormwater utility is the way to go for Lake Apatcong to address the HABs. However, it is our position that a utility must be on the table as part of a suite of possible solutions. To work, any solution is almost certainly not going to be simple or quick. It is likely, likely to include addressing faulty or non-functioning septics, removal of stormwater contaminants, and limiting fertilizer of lawns. We also need to map impervious cover in the region, the hard top we have covered our landscape with, to identify any pinch points where it might be most effective to apply stormwater management tools. Until we do the research specific to the lake, we don't know the correct answers, although you got a lot of them from Fred today. We don't know the correct answers, and only when we have the answers will we know if a utility is needed. If it is to protect the lake, it would, be, it would have to be regional to succeed. There will be no quick fix, but to make any fix the most cost effective, in other words, least expensive for everyone, the burden should likely be borne by all and re reached after informed and transparent investigation. The New Jersey Highlands Coalition is here to help and can try to bring resources to the table. One thing we know for sure, if we cannot stop the rain and the heat, harmful algal blooms will repeat again and again unless we work together to make sure they don't. There are materials about stormwater utilities over on the table from the New Jersey League of Conservation voters, and we should all have a new motto, star the algae. <laughs> My name is Elliot Bluga. I'm the Policy and Communications Director for the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. And I agree, of course, everything my boss said. But I'd like to add a couple of things. That now is the time that voluntary measures and recommendations won't work any longer. The issue is critical. We need the towns that surround the lake to get together, work hard, Money funding, these solutions, stormwater solutions, are not free. Grant funding will not pay for everything. This is going to be an effort that the entire community has to participate in. If people want to maintain their property values, their livelihoods, and the businesses that depend on recreational use of the lake, we can do it, but it's going to take hard work and commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to open it up to the general public. We have a list of people who have signed up to spoke. I would call your attention to the rules that we lay out on here. That's on our agenda this evening. We're going to limit each person's presentation to two minutes. So to be very efficient and get the best use of your time, try not to repeat anything that someone else has said so you can make your points something new that would inform all of us. So Colleen, you want to start out by... Okay, so first we had uh, on the list is Tim Clancy. He, he got it. Clock doesn't start yet. Okay, you can start. Tim Clancy, Lake Attack, I'm a lot of folks around Lake Delmar, and Lake Advocate. Dan, I don't know if you were referring to me in that early group. I was. I wasn't sure. We've been in so many committees yes, and stuff. It was there. That was a long time ago. Uh, one thing I want to bring up that I'm going to think about, and Fred, I apologize, the scientist name that did the presentation. I'm going to take your idea. You used the word out of bounds, or something out of bounds. We've had, wet, we've had wetter years. 2011 was much wetter, six inches more rain and much warmer than this year. Something changed. The septics that are all marginal or failing, and the stormwater that's not perfect, they've been constant for the most part. Something at this lake that creates the largest algae bloom ever seen before in the highest concentrations of cells, something explosive happened. Now, I'm well known now as a point man on the part of this lake. 
And Owens brought that up. Fred brought up some data about 2019 being the highest phosphorus levels in the last 17 years of recorded data. Great data. And when I asked, where is the word spot, a lot of people came to me and said, Tim, you think it's a quarry? I said, no, that's crushed stone. That can't change the chemistry of the lake. But more people call me and email me, don't have the papers. Fred's data, 17 years, highest phosphorus level ever. That's unusual. And then I found out in the 11 stations, where was the worst? I'm going to show this to the commissioners, but you've all seen these photos. These are aerial drones, and the yellow marker shows where station 10 is. That's the largest amount of phosphorus in the left. Those red ones, I'm going to hand this to DEP, because I think that Northern Compliance, nobody from Northern Compliance is here, right? I've asked repeatedly for the phosphorus and nitrogen levels in that stream that's been torn our, in our lake for over 100 days now. And you see the clouds, and you've all seen the magazine. Here's another one I'll hand to DEP that shows the plume of water entering this lake, and DEP fully was aware of it, and I didn't think it was going to be an impact. But now I found out that granite has phosphorus in great numbers 436 parts per million, double it if there's iron. We have iron. This may very well be that out of bounds thing we're looking for. Why did this happen months after this? And it's coming out of the screen and it's running there today. So we're going to chase our tails any further about all these things that have been constant and bad, not well run. Let's look at that stream and get the phosphorus level and the nitrogen level and start with that, please. 100 days it's been running in the lake. April Lever. Hi, I'm April Lever. I'm president of Community Association of Prospect Point, or Cat Beach. I also work for the Jefferson Chronicle, but I'm not working for them tonight. I'm here for Cat. So, you answered a lot of my questions, and I appreciate that. Uh, I was looking for transparency. I see it on the website. That's great. We're not on your list. We're not on your testing list. If you require two samples, we're never going to open. Can someone make sure we get on the list for testing? Can you restate the name of your association? Community Association of Prospect Point. We are at 2 Main Street, M-A-I-N-E. <laughs> States matter over in Prospect Point. So, so we have a close sign, we have no warning sign, we have no danger sign, we have no testing. We test off that beach, so the negative values that we got, one of the signs. You test it, yes. but the DEP has not. Correct. So if it requires our warning going away with two point tests, we're never going to get it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was regarding dog patrol, we talked about geese, is if nobody's ever used it, we use a dog patrol at our beach. We have dogs go down in the morning, dogs go down in the evening, in between people swim, obviously we make sure the dogs are cleaned up. We have the least geese uh, excrement on our beach. We virtually have none. So if nobody has been doing that, get your dogs out there, they love to chase them. And it's free. Um, Mayor Will, Susan, I know it is a new administration. When I was growing up and even beyond, I asked about sewers and I was told, not in your lifetime. I know you're new, but I'm going to task you to this on the agenda for the council and, and for you, is Jefferson certainly needs some sewers in there. We have high hills. This is all running into our lake. Um, Lastly, I want, to, I want to confirm that stagnation is a problem on the lake that creates this growth. So the marketing and the word that has been put out there by the press is don't touch the lake, don't touch the water. The message should be get on your boats and ride. Because people staying off this lake is causing one of the factors that is making that option grow. So get on your boats and ride. Yeah.
going forward, we have to stick with the two minutes because there's, there's a ton of people that are supposed to be here at midnight. So try to stick to your two minutes. Jim Digby. Uh, Rich Selma. I wondered if this stuff is airborne. I've heard time and time again if it's airborne. And if it is, how long does it live out of water? It's far <laughs> long so, Can you state your name, too? My name is Trinidad. <laughs> 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 Can you the, the question was whether or not the, either the, the algae or the com compounds are airborne. They're not airborne in the sense that they're, they're in the atmosphere. Obviously, if you get sprayed with water and they're in the water, they're up in the air hitting you, but they do not go up into the air themselves. So it's not like an airborne toxin. It's, it has to be associated with the water. Not like Star Trek spores. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Correct. Bob Hamburger. I'll leave up to read the next two or three. Uh, Michelle Solaro. Ed Wood. Mary Caskey. Jerry Kramer. Mary Ann Walsh. Yeah, this is, this is so people yeah. can start lining up. So my concern is over the health. Jerry Kramer, Maxim Drive. My concerns are for the health of the community. I personally have had two children, one very sick. Nobody is confirming whether this is from the lake or not. I have other friends who have had multiple health issues all related in my neighborhood at the lake. There's no one to report to. There's no doctor to speak to. The doctors have no idea what this is and how to treat it. We need some guidance. Our physicians and our health department need some guidance on where we can report this and get information for our health from the lake. CDC. What are the symptoms? There's been multiple symptoms. Flu-like, where it seemed like he had mono, but it was negative. Severe to the point where I would have taken him to the ER. He saw five, four different physicians. My other son had it milder. Friends of mine have had diarrhea. My sister had the rash and a massive cough. All of us are on massive steroids that are not helping. Jerry, where were they swimming? It's over in the Byron Cove area and, and the Henderson Cove area. Uh, whether we were contaminated or not, I don't know. Whether it's related or not, I don't know. There is no one to go to for answers. I called the DEP, they did not answer me back. The doctors just say they don't know what it is. So we need some help for our health of our community, reporting system and someone to give us information. encourage you to um, report the symptoms which are potential concern certainly to a the local county health department okay um, and we the Department of Health has an epidemiology program uh, the name is public health and food protection program their number can we get a, a list of okay reporting agencies? The, what, the, I'm to sorry report to? The, Local health department, right, your local right, health right. department, okay. And then um, the Department of Health, um, they are representatives on the interagency harmful algal bloom work group I talked about, the Department of Health. They have uh, epidemiology uh, folks that are on that group, so they know about potential health effects from harmful algal blooms. And I'll give you a number uh, that you could call 609-826. Uh, 4935. I'll repeat that. 609 826 4935. Uh, they would urge you, probably first, if you can, to report to your local um, health department. 
but they are also there to answer questions about that. These numbers are in on our website under um, some of our fact sheets that we have on there too if you don't get this number. But the Department of Health, uh, the epidemiologists there um, are familiar with the harmful algal bloom potential effects and um, would urge you to either call them or to call your local health department. So that would be the Sussex County and Morris County Health Departments, correct? Yes, as well as the municipal health departments in Morris County, as I understand there are, I think, three of them. Okay. Um, I don't know. I know representatives were invited today. I don't know if we have any of the local health representatives here. I'm sorry. Um, Jefferson Health Department is here. Is that right? And another one? Sussex, Sussex, we've been working with all of these, so they are familiar. Um, so I would urge you to work with the locals or the New Jersey State Department of Health. It's very important, they, they will collect reports. They have not, you know, observed uh, or received many health reports. So if you are concerned, we would urge you to please um, report those concerns. I'm just going to call a few names and you can line up. Um, Robert, this just says Robert and Barbara, David Molinari, Patty Sinelli, David Goddard, uh, John Kersman, Barbara, Barbara Loring, Lisa Kersman, and Nancy Waller. Okay, I think people were confused. They thought it was signing up just to come into the meeting. Okay, all right. Okay, Johnny McHale, Holly's. Okay, we're good? So, my name is Patty Sinelli. I run the Lake Pattern Adventure Company, and my tours have, I do guided tours around the lake with hydro bikes and pedal boards. So, right now, I cannot do anything because we have an advisory, correct? I was wondering, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. You, you said heavily exposure would, would lead to a, to a rash or a, you know, an effect on your, on your body. You said heavily exposed. What constitutes heavily exposure? I'm just, yeah. I'm sorry I don't remember the exact what you were referring to in terms of heavily exposed, but we are concerned with dermal contact with the water. So is it like a, is it like a minute, is it like four hours, is it? I'm not, I'm not certain that I can give you an exact time, right. I'm afraid. Um, and there are different sensitivities to different individuals, so right. there's no precise time. But it is, it is, you know, actual dermal contact with the water that we are concerned about, as well as if you are swimming, potential incidental ingestion, mm -hmm. which is equivalent to, you know, drinking some right. of the water. So. Those are the two um, biggest concerns. Okay. I also just wanted to see if we can, we can really hop on these towns and really knock down this, this whole septic issue. Yes. I mean, we need to, like, do we, do we get everybody to pump their tanks out once a year? I don't know. That's, that's like, I'm all about, like, doing the storm drain thing. Let's go, let's go check it out and, and clean them out. I don't care. Not just lake fronts, every Yeah, everybody. Let's do it. All right. Thank you. John Persman, Lake Apacon. John, John Persman, Lake Apacon. In the DEP presentation, it mentioned the EPA report uh, that they hadn't read yet um, or included yet. I read that report. It's 294 pages. I brought an excerpt of it with me. And I have to say I'm shocked. I just want to encourage the DEP to start implementing the EPA recommendations. Because for instance, for the microsystems, you are using a threshold of three. The EPA is using a threshold of eight. And they are basing that threshold on recommendation for six to 10 year olds. 
For 11 to 17 year olds, our recommendation is 22, and for adults over 18, it's 40. Similarly, for the cylinder rose for most option, which is the other category, it's eight, and as Fred Lebno also pointed out these numbers, EPA recommends 15 versus New Jersey's eight. But bear in mind, EPA is basing it on the data of a 2017 study done on six to 10 year olds. They then took that data and said, how much water do six to 10 year olds accidentally ingest and factored in body weight, and that's how they then get for 11 to 17 year olds, it's 44, and for 18 year olds, it's 80. So right now, the DEP is using a standard of eight when for adults it's 80, a standard of three when it's a standard of 40 for adults. So some states have already implemented a phased approach of a warning, a watch, and then an advisory. And they are not jumping to signs all over the state that say, don't have contact with water. Um, similarly, on the cell count, we have a standard of 20,000 cells. They have in Pennsylvania 70,000, Idaho is 100, other states have 250. At the, at the town level, I, or at the local level of this lake, must you really treat the entire lake as one place? Can't you just say, this beach is good, that beach is it. And, 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 and just look at, I mean, there, there's nothing in these standards that even say you must do any of these things. These, they only go to advisory level, not telling people have no contact with the water. And then I just want to say, you know, I've recommended that the, we follow the EPA guide. The EPA also has kits to say drains to lake, which we should put all over the storm drains. And, if, and when you're in any business, any residence, if you smell something, say something. It's a septic, it's failing, let's focus on those. Thank you. Hi, my name's David Gaddick. Uh, I own Lake Samarina uh, in Landing. Um, um, this advisory from the start has been uh, publicized as the lake is closed. Uh, which was never the case, and it has completely devastated the businesses around the lake, not only mine, the restaurants, and the marinas. I mean, from last Saturday having a blinking sign on Route 80 to say like a pack on this closed is absolutely ludicrous. Um, it, it would be nice to know if we could get sections of the lake open again, um, or not open, the advisory lifted, that people could go to different parts, not necessarily Byron Cove, but other parts of the lake to swim and water ski and tube and do other things. Your findings didn't find positive results. The EPAs, or the DEPs did. There's gotta be some kind of happy medium to the findings to get people back to the lake, people coming back to the lake, either they're renting boats, fishing, water skiing, tubing, swimming, whatever they are here to do. Um, it would be nice to have some kind of timeline uh, some kind of projection on when we can um, expect something like that to happen. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Don McCauley Holly. I'm speaking um, as a 30 year lakefront resident, and as Tim Clancy would say, I'm not being affiliated with any other organization other than myself as a personal resident. Um, I just would like to say that the information coming from the DEP is very helpful to have it on the uh, available on the website right now. Um, I just wish it could have been more readily available to our community because we've really been devastated by the impacts that businesses um, around the community and having that information more readily available would have been helpful. So thank you for putting up it on the website. But I, what I'd really like to hear from you, and if I missed it, I apologize, what is your plan to let us know when you're going to reopen this lake and how are you going to get that word out to the public? Ooh. Thank you for that. I'm, uh, we are incredibly acutely aware of your desire to know sooner rather than later, hopefully, when you'll be able to get back into the section of the lake. It depends on what the data says. So at this point, we don't see any basis um, from the data. We really looked hard. I know our people worked really hard to try to do that to find if there were sections that they could say were okay. 
but it's not looking like that right now. We can't give you a time frame. Um, it depends on Mother Nature and what happens out there next. Uh, we can't control that, but what we can promise you that we will do is keep looking and let you know as soon as we can lift the advice for any part of it. Uh, before we go any further, uh, Sussex County Health Coach Carol, do you want to come up and maybe you can answer some of these health questions that people ask? Just stuff aside, maybe you can answer some of these questions. It's over here. Tell me just to be here for the question? No, you need okay. the mic. Speak close to the mic. Okay, um, I know someone did ask about uh, the health department from Byram. So um, you can call Public Health Nursing at 973-579-0350, ask for Public Health Nursing, and they can give you information on the effects and also on which doctors have been notified that there may be potential algal bloom um, symptoms that are coming through them. Is there an antibiotic? Is there a medicine to treat it? That I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that question. Not at this point. I mean, yeah, right now, not, not at this point. There's not a way to treat it. It's a bacteria, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean, it literally, until 2014, people were really not concerned about it. Okay. Barbara Loring, Barrow for PACCON. Um, Kim, you mentioned something about aeration. And I've asked, you can mention something about aeration. Would it help if everybody who owned a bubbler turned their bubblers on and started aerating this water? Would that change some of the dynamics? There's a lot of bubblers on the lake. And they could, ice eaters, bubblers, whatever, it moves water, it aerates it, it throws it up. And I asked Fred Steinman when he didn't know, should we all turn our, put our bubblers in and turn them on? Um, I, I'll just answer it real quick. I mean, if, if you turned all the bubblers on, it, on a very localized basis, you may not you may see a benefit in terms of you're not a, you don't have an accumulation of cells, but other spots you may turn your bubbler on and literally see no effect. What you need to do is get an idea of you know the, the, the size and the depth of your cove or your shoreline, and know how the prevailing winds operate. Because right. just bubbling vertically may not do it. You may need a horizontal circulation system. Well, we so. We can, we can well, turn it any direction. The, th the thing is, is, what you need to do is you need to have some data on your shoreline so that you can design that bubbler or that circulation system or that mixer to be appropriate for that site. Could we get that out? I mean, well, we've got a huge shoreline. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of shoreline bathymetric data that's not that old. We did it maybe three, four years ago. So if you contact the commission, they can forward your information to us and then we can provide them with the data. So at least you have some information on your section of the lake if we've done it. And then you can approach someone about designing something appropriate for your site. Just turning the bubblers on, it might work, it might not work. It can't hurt. It can't hurt. It can't hurt, but, but if you have that bubbler too close to the shoreline, no, I'm, I'm just saying, it'd be causing a lot of erosion, and you're breaking up that shoreline, that soil associated with that shoreline can slump in and it has a lot of phosphorus associated with it. So you actually may exacerbate the problem with the bubble. Mine so that, is between two docks at 10 feet out and I'm in river sticks on the outside of the yeah. bridge where that water moves constantly. We've used circulation systems in the past for certain large coves and what you can do there is, like you're saying, experiment. Say, okay, what if it's out here? What sort of impact am I going to have relative if it's over here? But again, it's, it, it'd be better to have data on your site to know what would be the most appropriate way of circulating out. Um, Most people, if you have a bubbler, you know what your waterfront is like. You'd be surprised. There, oh, excuse me. There are a lot of people that will claim it's 10 feet out, and then we do the bathymetric assessment, and it's fine. So that data is already there. 
Right. Or just ask the commission. They will forward the info they will forward the request to us. And then if we have that bathymetric data, we will provide it to them and they can email it to you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Mike Ron Swartz from the Lake Pack on Rain. Um, my concerns are more centered around the overreaction to all this reporting. Um, I mean, my personal experience, I'm in a lake every single day. Just by the nature of my business, I'm in the water every single day. I have had no reactions, no rashes, and I've got very sensitive skin. But regardless of that, I'm more concerned about the data and the limits. Now, one thing that Fred was showing us here is that the federal limits for thresholds are twice as high as that of the state of New Jersey. So all these, all this testing that we're doing, how does a lake fare compared to the federal limits, and why are New Jersey limits so much lower than the federal limits? It seems like it's, it's not a real science yet. No one really knows what level is a real problem. And things are like this being over-exaggerated. The media got a hold of it. It's on Route 80. It's on the Turnpike. I mean, it got so blown out of proportion to a point where people are even afraid to look at Lake Effect. <laughs> so I would, I would like to ask and maybe somebody address why the big difference. I mean, literally, we're talking twice the levels that the federal people say it's okay, but New Jersey wants to be so much better, and they want to knock it in half. So what's the real limits? What's the real problem area? It doesn't seem like there's a real exact science to me yet. Thank you for the question. Um, right now, the difference between the federal numbers, which were just released, and New Jersey's numbers, by the way, New Jersey developed these numbers in the absence of any federal numbers. New Jersey's numbers were developed by the toxicologists and scientists of the Division of Science and Research with specific peer review of these numbers. Uh, we needed them because the federal government had nothing to offer us for guidance. Um, right now, the difference between those numbers makes no difference with our advisories because they're not based on the toxin levels. They're based on the cell counts. So right now, it, it does not make any practical difference in terms of whether you are applying the data. Uh, federal new, brand new guidelines for the toxins versus the uh, numbers from uh, New Jersey. I would also point out that there are a number of toxins for which EPA doesn't have any numbers. States have to act on those toxins and we need to have scientifically based numbers of our own. And different states do have different numbers. California, for instance, has a lower cell count number than we have and some lower toxin levels than we have. So it does it does vary. These numbers are not that different. And I guess the bottom line is application of EPA's numbers versus New Jersey's at this time would not make any difference in terms of our advice. Lisa Kersman, Lake of Hot Pump. I have two points I'd like to make. First, about the quarry at the end of northern tip of the lake, I really would like to understand its impact. I didn't see it mentioned anywhere in the presentation, and I don't know if that's because it's felt there is no impact or the impact hasn't been studied, but it would reassure me to know that someone has looked into the impact that their leakage for 100 days into our lake had and how it's affected the levels of all the things that are measured within the lake. And so I just want to know that that would be included in another study that would be done, determine if it had any impact or caused this in any way. My other comment is that when a press release is done, such as was made about the lake and was taken by the newspapers and the media, that it include more useful information. I think that when, I, when the, the decision was first made to put the advisory out, I was not even in the state of New Jersey, and I couldn't believe what I heard, and I was searching for information, and the DEP did not have the information available yet, and there was a lack of information available. So I think that when an advisory is made, it should include data, specific data, counts, levels, things that people can use to make informed decisions, because without any real information, people start forming their own conclusions, and it goes from panic to total disregard. So real data is needed in the place of time. Thank you. Um, 
Oh, go ahead. Just wanted to make sure people were aware. Uh, thank you again for that comment. The, all of the South Town data and toxin uh, numbers are now available on our website. We've always had a website that is general for compartmental information, but uh, we needed uh, some time to make the maps and put all the data out in a comprehensive manner. It's there now. So any additional data we get, we will simply be able to add it to what we have. So it will come to you quicker. Could you answer her question about the line up at the north if that was included in any other study? Okay, I mean, I, as far as the, the quarry, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay, I believe that one of our sampling sites is in the vicinity of that, so we will have some water quality data recently. But I think Fred has more information. Uh, yes, we did, we did some sampling in the stream as well as we do our routine monitoring for phosphorus and two things. One is we did see an increase of fine silt material being deposited in the stream. We, we provided that report to the commission. Um, in addition to that, we have seen over the last few years, uh, as, as, as was previously mentioned, that the phosphorus concentrations in the in-lake station immediately down gradient of that stream has increased over the years. And so in June, when I showed those elevated phosphorus concentrations with an average of 0 0.043, the highest concentration at station 10 was 0 0.07, which, is, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot of phosphorus. And it was coming from somewhere immediately up gradient of that sampling station, where, where, and that's where the quarry is located. So we do have some information to show that there's some elevated phosphorus concentrations coming in from that section of the watershed. Um, we, we did sample for alkalinity. We do have some in situ data on pH. I don't have that at my fingertips. But I do know we've seen some elevated phosphorus concentrations. Yeah, I, I can't answer that. Yeah. Yeah. The quarry will be asked to take any action to remediate this, to ensure it doesn't happen, to um, or to compensate people for their loss if they are the cause of the, the issue. Hi. My name is Bruce Friedman. I'm with the DEP Day and the Director of Water Monitoring and Standards. This really is something that um, I wish our northern compliance people were here, but we didn't imagine that welding concrete, our welding quarry would come up. <laughs> well, back in, back in February, there was a uh, discharge um, from, the, uh, from the quarry through from their stormwater ponds that they used to wash their, their quarry material. Uh, we issued NOVs to them twice, and from my understanding, the repairs were made that there's no ongoing discharge from the quarry. But what we're gonna do is we'll look into that. We'll reach back out to the Bureau Chief from Northern Bureau uh, Water, uh, Water Compliance and Enforcement and confirm that that's the case. Um, there's also been penalties issued in this case, and there is going to be some remediation, but I don't know off the top of my head. You know, I don't have that information to share with you. I can, I can yes. use up the link. Yeah, the penalties going directly back to Lake Packon? Hello everyone, I'm Josh Rosowski with the New Jersey State Park Service. Um, we did get an update late this afternoon about um, what we've done uh, in DEP regarding the welding quarry since our last meeting. So I'm just going to give you a couple of those updates. Um, Weldon uh, has constructed a silt berm prior to the Weldon tributary, uh, entering Lake Pakong to minimize the passage of silt. From the tributary to Lake Opaca, um, and they've also placed an oil boom there from uh, some other issues that have happened in that area earlier. Um, with NJDEP oversight, uh, Weldon has also removed approximately 13 cubic yards of stone finds from the area between the transfer pipe that leaked and the tributary. Weldon also provided staked hay bales and silt fencing at multiple kit locations throughout the tributary to minimize the passage of fines in the Lake Pacon. Um, and he, the DEP has continued to monitor that and make sure that um, the sediment uh, is, is removed, uh, but some of that is still ongoing. Um, 
New Jersey DEP, we mentioned last month, um, was going to do a fish survey of the area. Uh, they did do that on June 12th. Uh, the survey found only one fish. Um, but there's basically two reasons why this could be happening. Uh, the near absence of fish may be due to natural stream conditions. Um, if the stream is uh, intermittent, uh, meaning that it dries up at certain times, that could be one reason. And the other, of course, could be because of the contaminants and pollutants that have come into that area. Um, New Jersey DEP also intends to conduct a fish survey uh, in the area of Pat Cobb. Josh, sure. Would you just tell them how much the penalty was? Public. It doesn't say right there how much the penalty was, so we don't know. But more important than the penalty is looking at their ongoing operations to see if that is continuing to be a problem. And we will take a close look at whether the action, the enforcement action that we have taken up there is, is enough and whether or whether more needs to be done and whether this is contributing to the algorithm. I think we just don't know that at this point. But if you have my personal word for it, we're going to be looking into it. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Carey. I live in Hopakong. I am a marine technician at one of the uh, marinas on the lake. I'm also an avid water sports participant. My question for you folks is, is it a citable offense to go wakeboarding, water skiing, kayaking, swimming, etc., in Lake Hopakong? No. No. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Rich McFadden from uh, Lake Pacon, uh, waterfront owner, also a licensed engineer. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm certified in microbiology, but looking out for the public interest is basically my business. Uh, Ms. Commissioner, looking at the data you guys have just posted this afternoon, and I'll say it satirically, I don't know why you didn't present it tonight. On the 26th, I would have made the exact same decision. I would have closed the lake. I would have said that we had issues. Your aerial coverage showed 80% coverage of the lake with a bloom. You then repeated a flight on the 20th, 28th. It was down to 50%. You repeated a flight on the 30th. And it's posted on your site. And 95% of the lake is clear. Explain to me why a flight on the 3rd hasn't been posted, nor the data from the 5th has been posted. At the end of the day, I believe there's a balloon. I believe it needs to be dealt with. All the stormwater issues need to be dealt with. But the damage that can be done from hysterical, inflated media concerns can actually be more devastating than what's going on here. You need to take a hard look at this data that you're now producing and really consider lifting the ban and correcting the damage that's been done to date. All right, that's, that's a great point. And uh, we are just developing this aerial uh, ability to estimate uh, microcystin or phycocyanin, phycocyanin um, levels using remote sensing. You cannot rely solely on remote sensing. The remote sensing is a tool that allows us to look at large expanses of a lake. We also use the same technology or a similar technology on our coastal flights along the beaches. It allows us to pinpoint where an algal bloom is occurring, and then we can send staff out to take physical samples of the water. We don't have 100% uh, correlation between what that sensor is showing and what the cell counts are. So when we saw that the sensor data was showing that the bloom was dissipating, we put all our boots on the ground. We sent everybody out there to grab samples. We sent them in the lab to analyze those samples, to run the toxins with the hope that we would be able to partially reopen the lake in time for a 4th of July. We were very upset when the cell count results came in and did not 100% collaborate what the sensor was telling us. We still had, and there was no, there was no pattern. We looked at the main lake, hoping that we'd be able to open up the main lake. We looked at the north, we looked at the south. There was no way that we could define a geographic area and say definitively, 
go ahead, go back in the water, go back swimming, go back and have primary contact. Our number one concern is public health. We're not trying to hide anything. We're trying to protect people, protect your families, protect your, your grandchildren, your children. And it was our call based on the science, based on the levels that were developed by our scientists, that we couldn't pull that advisory at the time. And we're gonna go out there every Tuesday, every Thursday, and continue to test. As soon as we see levels consistently below that 20,000 cell count, we're gonna do everything in our power to lift the advisory, whether it be in sections, whether it be for the whole lake, whatever is supported by the, by the monitoring results. So we pre, we pre caution we did a precautionary closure of the, of the lake and gave an advisory saying don't come in contact. We also did specific closures at specific bathing beaches. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and we will when we see that the cell counts in the main <coughs> lake are below the 20,000, we will then go out and start testing the beaches. And we're not going to test every single beach. We're going to test beaches that are representative of a larger geographic area. So if it's Byram Cove, we test two beaches in Byram Cove, they both pass two days in a row, we'll lift it in that entire area. So we're going to try to look at this. We're going to work our way around to the beaches. What we base it on is there's no visual hab anymore. And if the cell counts are below and the toxin levels are below. So we're going to work our way around as rapidly as possible. But I can't guarantee that this is going to happen next week or the week after. These things tend to persist. I think Fred talked about in his presentations, and once they're here, we tend to see them year after year when the conditions present themselves. Hopefully we're never gonna see it the way we saw it um, earlier last week where it covered the vast majority of the lake. 80% of the lake was covered with this harmful algal bloom. I don't wanna ever see that again. That, it was an experience that was good for GEP. We didn't revel, you know, we, we, we didn't wanna do this. We did it to protect public health. And we're committed to do what we can to reduce nutrient phosphorus inputs into the lake through watershed management plans, lake restoration plans, um, to work with you guys to try to find a long-term answer to this problem. But I, I'm afraid this is a new paradigm and this is the new normal. We're gonna see this more and more. And we're gonna try to ramp up our response and do it in a responsible manner to protect everybody in New Jersey. It's just like on the bathing beaches. We test them on a regular basis. And if the bacteria counts, and we're talking about Enterococcus, which is a different type of bacteria, but if those bacteria counts are up above the level of 104 colonies uh, per milliliter, we close that beach. We post an advisory. If it retests the next day above, we close that bathing beach. And nobody likes it down at the shore, and we close those beaches, but we have to do it, and it's a tough part of the job. I'd like to see our beaches open 100% of the time, but we have a job to do, and that's to protect public health, and that's what we're trying to do. Are you reading the names from the list to go up? So I'll read a few, a few more names. It seems like people are just coming up that were called out. Oh, is that what we're supposed to do? No, we're leaving. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Elliot. Just come up. Yeah, I think just come up. I think people misunderstood this list, and uh, if you want to, if you'd like to speak more. Hi, I'm Lori Rivera. I am from Long Valley, and I am from Englewood, Florida. I've been dealing with this bacteria for five years. I teach small boat sailing to 10 to 17 year olds. Children are getting sick. There, I have five kids that never went to school this year at all. Could not get well, doctors didn't know how to treat them. I had a student with a small shaving cut on her leg. It was a nine inch scar, it went septic, she almost lost the leg. Doctors did not know how to treat it. I have a guy who lived across, across the street from me on the bay, lost both his legs. Four months, the first leg, four months later, the second leg, non-diabetic, cuts on his legs into the blue-green algae, lost both his legs. This is serious, folks. Don't go out wakeboarding. Listen to your government. They are trying to help you. Your local government, I think more so than the federal government, who has not taken this 
charge since 1965 this has been growing and this has now become what I think a world health crisis not just a national health crisis be careful listen to the people who are trying to help you here this is very serious I have a rash that doesn't go away I'm trying to get out of Florida we lose our voices we have all kinds of different symptoms people don't understand I've had my lymph nodes biopsy not cancer thank God blue green algae be careful can you say your name again Mari O'Gara it does not affect everyone. It does not. It affects a small amount of people. It doesn't hit everybody. That's what you have to figure out. You're going to be the asset I'm sorry. You said you had a sailing school in Florida? Toxic puzzle. Watch the movie. Rent it on Amazon Prime. It will tell anyone everything. All right, I just want to clarify, you said you're in Florida? And New Jersey, and New Jersey. Right, but your sailing school, that's that's in the ocean, right? Or in the back bay? Bay. Bay. Okay, in the back bay, there's there's another organism called Vibrio vulnificus. Okay, and you probably saw some of that in the press recently, because we did have a case last year in the Delaware Bay. But a wound infection from Vibrio vulnificus can cause septus, and can, can result in the amputation of a, of a limb and, and death. But that's not what we're talking about here, okay? This, this is a harmful algal bloom and it's a totally different type of uh, vibrio. It is not a vibrio, and what she's talking about is vibrio vulnificus. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Hi, I'm Vanessa Lynch from the Lake Forest yeah. Club Board of Trustees. Um, you've answered a lot of the questions that I came in with tonight, so for that, um, I thank you. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Lake Forest is in the Woodford section of the lake, the North Shore. Um, I hear much of the discussion going on has been about the main lake and southern areas. Um, so, of course, my first question, and I, I think I've heard some conflicting information, um, are areas of the lake currently being looked at independently with regard to openings and closings um, of the swimming beaches? You know, I think I heard a few minutes ago 20,000 count in the main lake, and then we would start looking at the beaches. Um, but given the section of the lake that we're in, I think we have some concerns that perhaps our area is not representative of the lake as a whole. Um, so I would ask some specific attention be paid to that area. Can you comment on whether, what the situation is with that? Okay, and, and in the meantime, I'll keep going because I know there's a two minute limit, I'm gonna try and keep it quick. Um, will all of the locations be tested on both Tuesdays and Thursdays? Do you have more to go? I, I do have additional questions, but if you want to cover this one first, we no, can. Yeah. Okay, um, so will all of the locations around the lake be tested on both days of each week, Tuesday and Thursday? It's not listening. All right. So we're sampling a subset of all those beaches. It's ST, it's kind of hard to read, but there's sampling, we're basically mimicking the, um, ST5, ST14, then the next one. ST1, ST2, ST3, they don't, that doesn't mean anything to you, but those, I guess it's eight or nine sites are what we are looking at, go back to the map as a spatial coverage of the lake. The lake is too large for us to go out and sample the entire lake. So we have to look at representative sample locations and base our judgment on that. So we have areas that are up north, we have areas that are main lake, we have areas that are on the shoreline, we have areas that are south. And we haven't seen yet where it's clear in any geographic location that will allow us to differentiate a Northern Cove, Byron Bay, River Styx, anything like that. We're still seeing high numbers around. And what Leslie had covered, sometimes they're low, and then the next day, 
it jumps back up. So you can see on 628 on ST2, uh, which is a mid late, we were at 36,000 cell count. Two days later, it jumped up to 65. So we're not seeing any trend of diminishing cell counts. So you pull up Lake Forest and drop them? Okay. So you can see 626, we were below. Yeah, so, so on 626, it was 9,750. Yeah, and then 701. And on 701, it was 115,000. But look at 72 the very next right. day. So, I don't so we're not seeing a trend. We can't look at one number and say right. it's good because based on current, wind, uh, what's feeding the outward loop, it could, it could rapidly dissipate and it could rapidly ramp back up. So when we talk about two consecutive tests and coming in with passing results, am I correct to assume that if we test okay in the northern section of the lake where you have representative uh, you know, areas being sampled, if that area of the lake tests okay on Tuesday and Thursday, does that mean that we would potentially have uh, permission to reopen our swimming beach on Friday? Theoretically, yes. We're gonna have, okay. we, have, we have to look at the entire geographic region. We have to see that the sampling point that you're referring to is representative of a larger area. I think Woodport Bay would be the closest to us. So what we would probably do is then go in and do more intensive sampling around that area. But if that's the case, we have two. But you can see in Mount Arlington Beach on uh, 7 1 and 7 2, we're at 12,750, 14,125. But they're still very ele elevated cell counts. And two days earlier, it was 179. So right now, we're still trying to feel this out and see where it's going. <coughs> yeah, escape. So no. I don't, I don't, I want to just finish up my list of questions. I'm sorry, I only got two minutes. Um, how, how often will the DEP update the website with the testing results? So thank you for putting the website out there, but now how often can we expect to see that change? Now that the map and the charts are up, as soon as we have body short data, It'll be the day after the data is available from the lab. We'll just add that to the column that you saw then. Okay, so it's not a weekly update, it's a day-to-day it's a -day -day as soon as the results are available. Right, it takes about 24 hours for the analysis to be done. So I would anticipate the next day, now we can just simply add the numbers to the table that are on the website. Great, thank you. Uh, are there independent testing companies that can test for the cyanobacteria or toxins? Well, I imagine there's one here. Um, in terms of, there are there are consulting firms or there are private laboratories that do cell counts to be careful the methods that they're using. Um, and there are other companies that do toxin analysis, but you know, yeah, I, would, I would say it should be lab analysis. Okay. I've had good questions, so thank you. Can you ask where the new Bowies will be placed? Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm um, just a resident, James Masaluski, from the Alba Point area of the Pentagon. I've been living uh, at the lake uh, since I was six years old, and you can tell from the color of my hair, I must be well over 50 years. Um, I know there are people here with immediate economic interests in the lake, and I, I sympathize. But as a resident, and many residents here, I think we all wish that the lake water quality approximates more, say, the water quality of Lake George than, say, Lion Kool Aid. And we only have to look down off our docks to know that the lake is sick, right? So I, I would suggest maybe. One of the topics that was discussed here is septics, and I know we have mayors in the audience. Uh, I know in a pack on, they were thinking about requiring uh, some kind of regular three year or some annual basis septic, uh, uh, septic cleaning. 
mandatory, not what? Yeah, they canceled it. They canceled it, yes. So I would ask the mayor, knowing that I'm not a smart person, based on what you've heard here today, would you support mandatory septic or not? Because you would. Is that a yes or no? I, I, yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, appreciate that. And um, the, the second thing is, you know, the, the phosphorus is the food. But I'm thinking in some cases, like um, um, Spruce Run, it's, it has a different environmental footprint than a pack on. And to me, um, you have boats that go between lakes. And I know Lake George requires hull inspections. Are you thinking about spring fit? Uh, so no hull inspections would be required. And, and finally, the person in front of me asked, uh, new buoy markers, when are they going to be? Where, where? Where are they going to be? You're talking about the, the sensor, sensor yes. buoys? Okay. Yeah. They will be in two open areas of the lake. One of the areas was um, ST2 in the center portion of the lake. And actually, I'm not certain whether the EP1 is going to go. Okay, and the second one will be in the southern portion of the lake, closer to the state park. Thank you. Yeah, and USGS is responsible for one of them, so we thank them. Hi, uh, Gina Likens, resident of Sussex County. I just have a quick question and a comment. The question is, in the news media, there was some conversation about uh, the, the wells, the well water, and is, is there any kind of testing being done on well waters that are closer to the lake and you know, just making sure that that part is safe. So I'll, and then my comment is, um, if I understand correctly, that you're just testing on Tuesdays and Thursdays and given the economic impact that is affecting this region, I would encourage you to do it every day until we can get it open. Tom D'Onofrio, my name is Jimmy Jersey. Uh, I've heard a lot of discussion about catch basins tonight. And I, just want to address, I just want to address the catch basins. That catch basins actually, I've been in construction my whole life, I'm third generation, built many catch basins over the years. But catch basins actually do not catch anymore. The catch used to be about two foot below the invert of the pipe. And maybe 20 years ago, the DEP uh, gave the directive to fill those catch basins to the invert of the pipe. So whatever goes into the catch basins, is washed into whatever body of water that the outflow uh, is, is at. So I asked the DEP to maybe revisit that directive and possibly catch again, although the only problem with that was the material became, correct me if I'm wrong, ID 27, meaning it was contaminated. So whatever sand would accumulate in that catch basin eventually became contaminated and they would then have to take it to a line landfill. So there's a battle there of uh, out of sight, out of mind, or what do you do with that contaminated material? So maybe that's part of the problem, that everything that's going on our roads, whether it's rubber from our tires or the, the blacktop that is getting deteriorated, but everything is ending up in bodies of water now. So maybe we need to revisit that again if we can. But am I wrong on that, that the invert, the, the, the concrete now is to the inverts of the pipe? The catch basins really don't catch anymore. It used to be stetcos that were going to clean it out and now vacuum, we have vacuum trucks, but we don't really do that process anymore, am I correct? I think that's on, on new catch basins, but not on older catch basins. I'm not aware of us ever going in and telling yeah, you to fill it up. As I understood, we're filled right up to the entrance of the pipe, but maybe not every one. But. So go out and take a look at them. Like, what he's saying is if the invert's up, and then the catch basin behind them, they're always going to have some standing water in there or a place where debris Well, that's the point. Catch. There is no standing water anymore. Right. Well, so. Well, so we'll take a look. We'll take a look at that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Can you answer the well question? Um, let, 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 me, let me just jump in real quick um, about the stormwater and catch basins. A lot of the larger stormwater structures that we've installed, like the three chambered baffle boxes, you know, they've been designed to catch that material. So a lot of the grant funding was used to install these larger catch basins that have multi chambers. And they have these drop areas, and then they have a trash rack on top. So the trash rack collect, collects the leaf litter, the solids go to the bottom. The nice thing about that is it's relatively easy for the for the uh, uh, for the um, 
um, the, the operations crew, the, D, the, the, the Department of uh, Public Works crews to go out and clean those out with a backhaul and just remove that leaf litter. So that's one of the reasons why we focus so much on those multi-chamber uh, structures. And then real quick on the wells, typically, you know, the wells aren't being impacted by cyanotoxins because typically you don't have blue-green algae growing in those leach fields, generating cyanotoxins, so that's not as much of an issue as water that is being directly pumped from the lake that has the blue-green algae. Hi, my name is Phil Riley. I live in 14 Culture Place, Andover, New Jersey. I'm part owner of a company called Watermark Technologies. I'd like to give you an idea of what this perfect storm was that hit this lake this year. March, April, May, and June, the rainfall each month was between six and eight inches. When that level of rainfall hits a cold lake, you create a thermocline. So the lake is, the warm water is only three or four feet deep. The next thing that happens is the water table all around the lake rises. 75, probably 75% 75 of the homes in this community have septic tanks and leach pits and they're 30 years old. Now the 30 year old leach pit is a piece of concrete with holes in it. That leach pit is full and that stuff is coming from the septic tank into the leach pit, going to the surface and seeping right straight into the lake. And that's the perfect storm that you had this year. The problem is that perfect storm can happen again next year unless we do one thing. And the people, the consultants said one of the things you need to do is get rid of phosphate. There's really only one good way to get rid of phosphate in this, in any lake. And it's been done in hundreds of lakes across the entire United States. And that is you need to treat it with a neutralized aluminum sulfate precipitate. The solubility of aluminum phosphate is 10 to the minus 19. So what you do is you treat the column of lake, the flock comes down and settles, and it sits over top of the mud. Now the problem with phosphate is, if you just clean the column, that ain't gonna work, because the mud contains a lot of phosphate that can leach right back into the column. So what you have to do is you have to trap the phosphate in the mud. So you create this aluminum, aluminum hydroxide flock, it sits down on top of the mud, and it stops the phosphate coming in, from coming in. My proposal to this group and to the state is you do a test and you run the test next April. That means you've got to start to work on it today. And what that means is you take soil samples, you figure out where you're going to do the test. My suggestion is you do it at Byron Cove and out from Byron Cove a while, maybe 300 acres. And you take, let me just finish it. You take the samples and you do the test and you set up and do it. The cost, is approximately $200,000 per thousand acres to be treated. It's not insurmountable, but you will have a test to show how you can prevent the lake from going bad, control the lake, and eventually have something for treating the rest of the lake. Thank you. My question is, you know, I've heard it not a practical difference, and cell count. Now you're talking about blue-green algae, cyanobacteria. If you're counting that, that's not the toxic stuff. It's when that dies that it releases the cyanotoxins. But it doesn't sound like you're counting the toxins, but that's what makes it a harmful algae bloom. So if you have these two monitoring buoys out in very main portions of the lake, that's kind of not where people's, people are swimming. So those counts, A, is it the actual bacteria or is it the toxins? That's the first question. Thank you for the question. Uh, we are testing both the cell counts as well as the toxins, both in the laboratory. They're both being tested. The buoys we were referring to are not the test mechanisms for those two things. They're helping us understand the water quality, the changes in water quality that may be related to harmful algal bloom. So the actual measurements that you're asking about are done in the lab, and it's both cell counts as well as toxins. So the monitoring buoys aren't testing 
They're monitoring the water for the to see if they can produce there. I, so they're monitoring both water quality impacts that come from a harmful algal bloom and water quality impacts that can relate to uh, helping to generate the, the harmful algal bloom. We are also, as I recall, looking at the pigment itself. Okay, so one of the things that we're doing with those is actually measuring the unique pigment we talked about before that is unique to cyanobacteria. So that will also help us. And the reason these buoys are important is because this is continuous monitoring. It's not, you know, filling the bottle, doing it one day, coming back two days later, it's continuous. So it helps. It's not going to be immediately accurate for, for swimmability. Right, the swimmability is done in the beaches and in the open areas of the lake, and that is both cell counts and toxins. Okay. And I just want to add, as far as a lot of, everyone knows, I think you guys said 40% of this is storm water runoff, and then there's septics, and there's salt, which is also an issue, because salt that comes off the road kills the zooplankton, and zooplankton is algae. So that's an issue that really wasn't addressed. But we've got septics, we've got global warming, we've got, we've got the perfect storm now. But in all the runoff, if you put in active carbon filters, that's what kills cyanobacteria before it can actually make its way into the lake. But that means we need filters in all the runoff, in all the drains, and it needs to be maintained and cleaned out. So it's not just the drains and what's collected there and whether it gets sucked out or not. You need the right filters in there to filter out the cyanobacteria before it turns toxic. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, Cliff London, former mayor of Opacon, 68-year resident, 28-year veteran of the Lake Opacon Regional Planning Board, your predecessor agent, um, and 35-year sufferer from algae allergies to this lake. Um, and well, let me also add, it was my master's thesis that actually started as the first comprehensive water quality study on Lake Opacon and ended up as Fred, Fred Lovelock's work. We have known about the problems for Lake Pakon for the past 40 years. Everything mentioned tonight was identified 40 years ago. What happened with this algae bloom is that this, the lake, that one beautiful creature out there, is sending us a message. Our efforts have failed. We are not doing enough. And I don't want to criticize the commission because I know you guys have been batting your heads up against the wall like we did for 28 years before you because there's not enough resources. There's not enough people recognizing what the problem is. And what this lake has told us is that our efforts to date have failed. We must do more. The lake is not getting cleaner. The lake is not getting better. And we've got to redouble our efforts, okay? And it's gonna take a massive undertaking, okay? We, we must do something about sewers. We must do something about stormwater. We must do something to address the dredging. And it is not one government alone. It is state, it is local, and it is federal. It is everybody. And it is everybody in this room. Because the one thing that came up in my experience frequently is everybody says, you got to do something about the lake, but don't do anything that costs me another penny, and don't do anything that affects my use of the lake. Well, we've got to recognize that everything that happens in the watershed is our responsibility, and we've got to redouble our efforts, but we need a massive influx of funds to address this. This is a message from the lake. We have not done enough to preserve this water body. Thank you. Jack Davis, I live on Shore Road in Woodport, and uh, same house for 42 years, same wife, everything's the same. <laughs> uh, I'm going to make it very, very brief. Um, I'm, I'm not here to talk about the, uh, the algae problem. I'm here to talk about one very specific problem that Tim Clancy brought up a little while ago. I don't understand how a little over a year ago we had a spill come into Lake of Pacon from Valley. It was cleaned up. Uh, I'm 14 houses from that. I'm 14 houses from that pipe where the oil spill came into the lake, and uh, now I see the, uh, the boom set up in the creek. And I'm not sure who I'm talking to here, so I'm looking at everybody. Now I see the boom set up in the creek, 
and it looks just as crappy on the north side of the boom as it does on the lake side of the boom, and the stuff is still coming in the lake. I don't understand why we just can't close that creek coming into Lake Pat. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, I'm Sarah Schindler. I live on Lakeside Boulevard in Hapaka. I've lived here for 23 years. Um, on the map that you guys had up there, it's pretty interesting. Um, where I live, which is the part of Hapaka, kind of our sewers, there's nothing. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So where I live on the lake in Hapaka, where there's sewers, there's nothing on that map that they put up there. There's no reports, there's nothing. I do have algae off my dock, it's not a lot. But what I find more interesting, I listen to all this information, and I know there are a lot of people in this room working really, really hard to figure out what's going on and why this is happening and, and why did it happen this year and what do we do about it. But the interesting thing to me is that all of you at the DEP and the Lake Commission are saying to us as residents, what are you gonna do in your community to fix this problem? Because if you don't do something, we're going to shut down your lake. Well, if it's our lake, let us take care of it. Let us do what needs to happen or help us. Help us figure out what the solution is. Give us some funding. Give us some autonomy. Give us some of the millions and millions of tax dollars that we send to Trenton that goes to the shore. Give it to the lake. We can't just put it on all of the residents of the lake when all of our money goes somewhere else. So I'm charging you at the DEP, get to your people in Trenton and talk to them because maybe they'll listen to you because they sure don't listen to us. Right now, you can go swimming in the lake in America. I also own a marina on Lake Packard on the North End, BB Marina. And the people up there have been swimming and they have been going out. We, the people, own Lake Packard, whether you know it or not. It's because the state never acquired the title. And the law says that if you own the bottom of a lake, you control the surface. And that was ruled back on Lake on the Mississippi River during a flood time when the river flooded and people were going up the little creeks into the lake and people took it their core and found out they couldn't do it. The laws are on the book. So you people sit back and get pushed around, shoved around, stand up, spread the word who will take it back on. And if you leave it alone, it's been doing a good job all these years lately. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Bob Brandon. I've uh, been affiliated with the lake for started. Uh, kids from Hopak, I went to Dover High School, but they didn't have a high school in Hopak. I gravitated to Lake Apac on and been here ever since. And uh, being a lifeguard at the state park, you could see across this room under the water. That's how good the lake was. And being a, uh, also a fisherman, the handwriting was on the wall. And they started ordering different types of fish that could live in a mud puddle. 
to survive Lake Baikon because the trout were dying off and the people weren't catching the trout. And the state still puts them in, but I think it's maybe to appease a few people. But for the last three years, there's been a green cloud coming across the main lake of Lake Baikon. And it just seemed like the state lumped out because in uh, August, of the last three years now, some of you people may want to check on it. We had such an abundance of rain, and I think it had something to do with the pH in the lake, but that green cloud disappeared and we lucked out. And I even mentioned it to people, the state really lucked out. Well, just recently I was eating lunch, and the guy was telling me about a housing development on Edison Road. And there's a couple hundred homes, I think, up there. And I'm a real estate broker, but I don't know how many homes were in that development. But they're all big, nice colonials and everything. And I thought they had septic systems. But it seems to be down hidden in the woods down there. Be like behind Jefferson Lumber and the Catholic Church that's there uh, opposite Cherry Road down in the back. There's a sewer plant down there. I don't know if anyone knows that. Well, I went down and, you know, being a fisherman, look at when you're in a river that's clean water, you pick up a rock that's clean and dry and grit. And, it's, and that rock represents, to me, uh, the reason they put rocks in the septic system is because the rocks grab the impurities. Well, it's the same way in a river. Those rocks grab the impurities. And I went and I visited that river the other day myself. And I'm just telling you, it's disgusting what's going on. And it's sort of hidden, that river comes in behind Jefferson Lumber and it actually I think comes out under the state police barracks. All right? But then I took it a step further and I didn't look at the tax records or anything, but that D the DEP owns that sewer plant. Now is that right? Does someone here know that? And you see how sewer plant operators work and I'm telling this because if somebody could question me all they want. When, it, when you get an abundance of rain and the water's running down through there and it's all brown, they don't want to treat that sewage, they open it up. And I've caught but many of them do. Now what about the Muskinacon River? If it's not safe to eat the trout or the fish in Lake Pacon, probably you shouldn't eat them in Lake Muskinacon. That's something they should tell us. And the Muskinacon River. All right, one, step, one second. One of the best trout fishing places, all right, in New Jersey was a place called Saxon Falls, right? And I'm sure a lot of you heard about that. And you go there, that's disgusting, the river, disgusting. You wouldn't even need to fish that in. And it's all because of that sewer plant that's in the trade zone. They don't trade it. How are you doing? Thank you, my name is Greg Borman. I'm a representative of the New Jersey Sierra Club. Most of the issues that, uh, that I'm addressing are statewide. Uh, I'm just going to address some of the solutions. Uh, one is, is the first thing you should do uh, is to tighten up your standards and, and move out and reestablish your water protection uh, and the stream buffer zones that were rolled back by the Christie administration. Uh, the second thing is, is to take a look at and establish strong total maximum load limits for phosphorus, nitrogen. Okay, thank you. Establish total maximum load limits um, for phosphorus, nitrogen, and other pollutants. Establish good watershed planning with an emphasis on stormwater management and restore septic management districts as we had in the past. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is that local communities need to step up uh, to reduce overdevelopment and sprawl in environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, the other hat that I wear is also the hub coordinator for the Sunrise Movement, uh, which the uh, objective is to take bold action with climate change. Uh, we've been looking at your uh, DEPs and DPUs uh, energy master plan, uh, and we took a look at uh, some of the recommendations from Rutgers uh, energy uh, storage uh, assessment. And one of the things that may help this particular thing to reduce the water uh, runoff uh, is in support of the wind and renewable energies is the aspect of developing hydro power storage units. Uh, and they specifically recommended that 
the northern New Jersey section uh, be uh, examined, you know, for that opportunity. It felt that there's a lot of geological structure uh, that was available here. Anyways, thank you. Coming here and, and Fred to answer a lot of technical questions, which are beyond us. <laughs> and we're all in this together, so let's all work together to see if we can come out with some positive results in the future to prevent this from happening. Okay, back to the agenda. I really don't have anything to report. Gosh, have you got an update? Uh, the only thing I'm, I'm interested in. Okay. 